the Tuesday, July 20th, 2021. Board of Education regular meeting for the Oceanside Unified School District. Welcome everyone. This is like our first meeting face to face. We're no longer in Zoom world, so I'm super excited. We all are to be here and, and have people in the audience. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and make an announcement of board member Eric Joyce location. He wasn't able to be with us today, but he is teleconferencing in. According to government code section 54953, permits legislative bodies to use teleconferencing. So board member Eric Joyce will be teleconferencing from the following location during the 6 p.m. session. And the address is 13991 North Gayton Road, Richmond, Virginia, 23233. So welcome, Eric. He's on the phone right here, so that's why we have a phone out. All right, so I'm gonna call the meeting to order at 6.05 p.m. I'm gonna go ahead and do a roll call. So I'm gonna start with Trustee Eleanor Evans. Present. Trustee Mike Blessing. Here. Trustee Raquel Alvarez. Here. And Trustee Eric Joyce. Present. Thank you, Eric. So we're testing our system. So thank you for your patience. All right. First item of business is. Sorry, I'm getting my thing. Public report out of action taken in closed session. Item 1C public employee appointment, principal, elementary, and secondary directors. The board unanimously voted to appoint Laura Hogue as principal of Del Rio Elementary School. Congratulations. The board unanimously voted to appoint Mandy Bell as director of elementary. The board unanimously voted to appoint Greg Smedley as director of secondary. Congratulations. All right, that's all we had for closed session report out. Our next item on the agenda is approval of the agenda. I'll call for a motion. Make a motion. Second. I have a first and a second. Any discussion? All right, I'll call for the vote. Approval of the agenda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Eric. <laughs> motion carries 5-0. Moving on to the superintendent's report, item 3A, Dr. Vitale. Yes, thank you so much and welcome everyone and congratulations to our new principal and our new directors. We're happy to have you in those positions. So just one more round of applause. It was a very competitive field. Congratulations. Just want to give an update on our 2021 summer school programming. It's gone very well. We've had over 3,800 students uh, served in our academic summer programming and 1,400 students in our afternoon enrichment. Of the students served, 62% uh, are considered uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged students. Uh, 1.6 are identified as students who are in foster care or experiencing transition in their housing and 18% receive services for learning English. And we've also had an extensive extended school year program for students receiving special education services. And overall, we've had a 92% attendance, which is really outstanding in summer school. In the morning time at elementary school, we featured a lessons taught by our fully credentialed staff that include targeted work in English language arts, math uh, that will accelerate our students to the next grade level, They've also had an opportunity in the afternoon programs to focus on uh, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, and our Meet the Masters program, which is an art program, physical education, which is very important, and additional science activities. And our high school students have recovered over 1,200 courses, uh, which is five credits for each course to uh, work towards graduation. So, so far we've had a very successful summer school program, so I wanna say congratulations to all who were involved with that. And coming up in August, we have our camps for our new TK and, and kinder students uh, to enhance their first learning school experiences. And we're very proud to be offering uh, transitional kindergarten at all school sites uh, this year for the first time. So thank you for the time to report. Excellent, thanks Dr. Vitale. 
Our next item on the agenda is board reports, item 4A. I'm gonna go ahead and start with Trustee Eleanor Evans. I do not have a board report tonight. All right, thank you. I'm gonna move over to Trustee Mike Blessing. No report, ditto as well, good summer so far. All right, I'm gonna move over to Raquel Alvarez. I do have something. Um, I have actually have been um, pretty busy. Um, I've been working at the food pantry at OHS, which has been amazing to see um, how we can reach out to our community and how we serve our community within the food pantry itself over the summer, and including the nutritional services as they serve food on Mondays also in the community and how we're serving them. So it's been interesting to see everybody coming out and just fun to see everybody also just getting ready and excited about coming back into school. Um, I went to um, a gathering with TC um, at the Carlsbad Lagoon and it was actually um, to get students ready to come back to school and excited and motivated to come back to school. So it was a, it was a fun time, but also a time of re-engaging them so that they're ready to come back and to be with each other and things like that. So that was an amazing time. Um, also had a meeting with OPD. Um, also just trying to get some conversation going on seeing how we can work together to help our students that are in need out there, how we can work together again as a community to help our students that are in need. Um, but one of the big things that um, I want to do is I want to celebrate one of our students, um, Tahina Pow Pow. She is actually um, um, one of our students that graduated, I believe, a year ago. Um, she's going with the USA under 19 national team for the Olympics. Um, so I want to celebrate one of our local students going and actually being a part of something that's amazing. And um, I got to spend the day with her and her family um, as they celebrated and got it ready you know, for her to, to go and to, because she's going to be going to Washington, D.C. for a week just as a team camp. And then they're going to Spain for a little bit to do some scrimmages. And then they're going to Hungary. And then in Hungary is when the actual games are from August 7th to 14th. So if you have an opportunity, watch them. I've been watching her because she in, plays in Oregon. She plays for Oregon. Um, and I've been watching her, you know, and even in our high school games and stuff, she was amazing. She was awesome. And so um, just to be able to celebrate one of our own is just, it, it, it warms my heart more than anything because it's one of our truly, one of our own homegrown students. And so again, if you have an opportunity, August 7th to the 14th, the games, and they're gonna be all in Hungary. So please watch, cheer her on. If you can, just remember that that um, she is from here. She's from OHS, um, so go Pirates, right? And Wildcats. Um, so um, just to be able to do that was amazing over this summer so far. I think that's been my number one thing so far this summer that I've been able to do. So again, thank you for that opportunity to TC and to the Pow Pows to be able to let me celebrate her and her amazingness. Thank you, Trustee Alvarez. Trustee Joyce, do you have a board report? Eric, do you have a report? There's a little bit of a uh, Yes, R real briefly. I, I just can sometimes hear the mic and sometimes I can't. Um, I had a chance to walk around some, <laughs> take my kids to the park and now that there's more parents in the open, I got to talk to some parents about TK who hadn't heard about the expansion and are really excited to have their students in class. So tell your friends, as um, Dr. Vitale brought up. And then we, uh, I was on the master plan committee and we're still looking for input on what our schools are gonna look like. We passed the bond, but now we still need uh, everyone's input to make sure that we have the, the schools set up in the best way for the best learning environment as possible for our kids. So take a minute if you haven't already to fill out that survey on the website. And then the last thing to report is that I had a great opportunity to tour uh, the wood shop at OHS and see some of the phenomenal brand new equipment that our students will be using to build cabinets and and all kinds of things that I couldn't even begin to explain, but looked really fun to play with. So I'm excited to see what they do this year and um, I, I appreciated the tour. Thank you, Eric. Our next, I, I do not have a board report tonight. 
So our next item on the agenda is item five, general consent items. I'll call for a motion. I'll move approval of uh, items 5A through 5R. I'll um, second. Consent. I have a first and a second. Any discussion or questions? All right, I'll call for the vote. All in favor of- Madam President, we do have a public comment. Oh, we do have a public comment. I'm sorry, hold the vote. That's, sorry, I didn't see that. That was just thrown in front of me. All right, we have one public comment for item 5G. Ann, will you call them up? 5G, Todd Madison. So Todd, I'm just gonna say this, even though I know you know the rules, but just because we're first time in person, we're more than happy as a Board of Education to receive comments about items and issues on tonight's agenda, as well as topics off of the agenda. Generally, each person speaks for up to three minutes, and then we'll kindly ask you to stop talking. <laughs> um, the total time for public input may be limited to 20 minutes per item or topic. While the total time per speaker for a given topic may be slightly reduced in certain circumstances, all persons wishing to address the board will have a meaningful opportunity to do so during this meeting. Sorry, Todd, I just wanted to get that out. Welcome, Todd, you have three minutes. All right, so um, first, great to be back here. Um, I like the ability to follow along with meetings while having dinner at home, um, but it's always nice to see everybody in person. So on this item, though, I thought I'd recap some personnel statistics for you from the last year. I understand we don't keep track of retention statistics and exit interview data, even though we have that data in front of us tonight and at every board meeting in the personnel assignment orders. I've asked that question several times. I know the answer. We don't have it. Bizarrely enough, in the past, we've also heard we have a problem with retention, a problem large enough to justify taking millions out of the education of our kids and driving the district close to bankruptcy to solve. Anywhere else, if the CEO or HR executive of a $200 million company running a structural deficit proposed spending millions to fix a problem, couldn't produce data showing there actually was a problem, the board would laugh, maybe fire them for suggesting it. Um, here it seems the objective is not to provide service to our customers and manage finances prudently, but the objective is to justify extra raises for all, and we know that, um, whether it requires taking from our kids or not. I realize facts and data are meaningless in this conversation, but since the numbers are posted in every board agenda, as they are here, I thought I'd tabulate them from the last year. For classified staff in fiscal 21, the adopted budget showed 737 FTEs. During the year, you lost 65 staff to voluntary turnover. Works out to a rate of 8.81%. For certificated, 917 FTEs. You lost 31 last year to voluntary turnover. Rate is 3.38%. ADP, largest payroll processor in the country, publishes stats. In 2019, they show the average turnover for education industry is 19.2%. That means OUSD's turnover for classified is less than half the norm, and the certificated is almost six times lower than the norm. That's really great news. People like working here. That's, that's awesome. It's pretty clear we don't have a problem with retention. Matter of fact, we have a retention rate any business would be promoting as a reason to work here, not hiding it. Exit interviews are how any business keeps tab on why people leave. Not here, where no such process exists. Um, plausible deniability, perhaps, so we can say we have a problem that doesn't exist, which is then used to justify taking from our kids to give everyone else more money, including the exact people who negotiate these raises via the Me Too clause, which is a great example of poor ethics, if I ever heard one. So making decisions that benefit district employees over our kids, ignoring the facts and data when doing it, Sounds vaguely familiar from issues we've heard in the past year, doesn't it? Um, we know you're working with labor groups to find now to find ways to give away as much money as possible to employees. Perhaps our board should actually use real data to determine what's necessary this time around. Maybe spend the money on our kids instead. So thank you very much. All right, we only had one public comment for item five. So I'm going to, we had a first and a second. Um, do we have any questions from my fellow trustees? All right, I'll call for the vote. All in favor of approving item five, general consent items? Aye. 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 All right, motion carries 5-0. Moving on to item six, these are presentations. 6A is OUSD Board of Education COVID-19 update. We do have five speakers on this topic, so we're first gonna have a staff presentation by Dr. Sparks. Great. Thank you. Good evening, board president, Dr. Begin, members of the board, superintendent, Dr. Vitale, and cabinet members. We are grateful and excited to return to in-person school this fall. 
at a, on a regular schedule and at full capacity. The following presentation will share with you the most recently updated guidance from the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, and the California Department of Public Health, CDPH, regarding recommendations and guidance for schools for the 21-22 school year as we continue to respond to a new variant of COVID-19 and welcome our students and staff to open schools while prior prioritizing our teaching, learning, and safety for every student and staff member. As has been our practice in OUSD over the past year, we will continue to require students, staff, and visitors to wear a face covering while indoors during school hours in classrooms, office spaces, and in school buildings. To the extent possible, our plan in OUSD is to ensure at least three feet of distance between people. However, to ensure safety of our students and staff, we will continue to adhere to the CDC and supportive CDPH guidelines to wear face coverings while indoors. These recommendations. Excuse me. We will ask you to leave. We will ask you to leave. We need to finish the presentation. We do have public comment on this item. Sorry, Dr. Sparks. Thank you. These recommendations for K-12 schools has been supported as well by the American Academy of Pediatrics as recently as July 18th when they released their interim guidance detailing the benefits of in-person schooling and the necessity to wear face coverings to protect all students and staff, especially those who are unvaccinated. Yeah. We will continue to use our face covering parent guardian acknowledgement form updated for the 21-22 school year to inform parents, guardians, and to allow them to acknowledge our policy. In accordance with CDC's guidance and CDPH's guidance, and due to the fact that many of California's school facilities cannot accommodate physical distancing, California will layer multiple other prevention strategies, including those in OUSC, such as continued masking guidance. Also, we'll implement a robust testing program. Every California school will have access to free testing through robust state testing programs for schools. While we do not yet have the testing program in place, we are working with several partners, including a partner who tested our student athletes um, last year, as well as part local partners such as Vista Community Clinic. Some state initiatives to support this guidance has been an historic budget investment, where in March, Governor Newsom signed into law a $6.6 .6 billion investment into education to safely reopen our schools and to address learning loss, especially for students most heavily impacted and school districts with concentrations of low-income students and students who are homeless. We have in-person learning, which this summer, over 88% of school districts in California had learning acceleration opportunities, and you heard from our superintendent that over 3,800 of our own students participated, with 1,400 participating after-school enrichment programs. Another approach has been vaccinating young people. We'll, we'll, we'll be working with um, local partners in uh, Oceanside to provide pop-up clinics and mobile clinics as well as events at schools, which I'll share more about in just a second, to provide the opportunity for young people to get vaccinated. There'll also be safety and family engagement opportunities where the CDPH has supported launching a family engagement campaign to address the concerns of students and family members who have some reluctance to return to school in person. Finally, the last part is COVID-19 testing supports. So we will be working with partners, as I stated a minute ago, to provide testing to staff and students um, as they need um, COVID testing support. According to the guidance, when both the exposed party and the infected person are wearing a mask in the indoor classroom setting, unvaccinated students, even those who were in close contact with the infected person, may undergo a modified 10-day quarantine, which is different from our previous year. It's a modified quarantine if, this, if the person who is identified as a close contact is asymptomatic, if they continue to appropriately mask as required, and if they undergo at least twice weekly testing during the 10-day quarantine, as well as continue to quarantine for all extracurricular activities at school, including sports and activities within a community setting. This is why mask wearing is critical, and this is because mask wearing and distancing cannot be enforced outside of the school with the same fidelity as inside the school. Additionally, the quarantine guidance states, the quarantine guidance states that recommendations for unvaccinated close contacts who are not wearing masks during indoor exposure is still 14 days. This is in accordance with the CDC and CDPH guidance. 
However, those unvaccinated contacts that remain asymptomatic may discontinue self-quarantine under the following two conditions. The quarantine can end after 10 days from the last exposure without testing. So that's a modified quarantine from 14 down to 10 days, which we've adhered to in the past in OUSD. Or they can quarant the quarantine can end after seven days if a negative test is received after five days from a date of exposure. So it does allow students to enter back into the classroom earlier and sooner as long as they can present a negative test. Additional guidance is around cleaning. So once a day cleaning has been shown to be uh, su sufficient to remove potential virus that may be on a surface. Also food service, um, there's no need to limit food service approaches to single use items and packaged meals. And there is still encouraged physical distancing between people um, to be maximized as much as possible. And then finally, we have ban drama and youth sports, which the CDPH will still be releasing guidance on, and that has not come out yet, but we'll be sharing that with you as soon as we have that guidance. Finally, we want to share where folks might be able to be tested and receive the vaccination. Most local pharmacies offer testing in the COVID-19 va COVID vaccine. Vista Community Clinic is one of our great partners who offers both services, both at their clinics, but also in their mobile sites that you'll see showing up to our campuses. The Oceanside VA Clinic on Mission Avenue supports testing and vaccines as well. And coming soon, you'll be hearing a lot more about our partnership with the San Diego County Office of Education, Vista Community Clinic, True Care, and the City of Oceanside. We'll be hosting several vaccination events for our young people to get vaccinated to ensure that they are safe from the COVID-19 Delta variant. Um, our, first site, our first site hosting a vaccination clinic will be Oceanside High School on August 10th, and we are excited to share more information and advertise that as that time approaches. And with that, I conclude and open up for any questions from the board. Thank you, Dr. Sparks. Do we have any questions? I know we have public comment. Do you have any questions, Raquel? I have a question. Go ahead. Okay. Um, when you uh, mentioned that... Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that um, there would be robust testing. Is it possible, uh, but you also state that um, people would have to go to the Vista Community Clinic and the um, drugstore. Not everyone's able to do that. Um, is it possible to have school sites where this testing could be done? It, it is possible. We, we've partnered with a, um, a, a local um, uh, organization this past year to provide all of our student athlete testing, um, which was required by the CIF guidance. And right. so they have been great partners throughout the past year, and they were still, they're still willing to partner with us this coming year and provide testing directly on sites for our students and staff. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions at this point? Okay, we'll go ahead and start with public comment. I'll remind you, you have exactly three minutes. I'm gonna, t because he is the presenter sharing the information with us. First comment, Todd Madison. All right, thanks again. So here we are again, talking about COVID crisis and impact on the education of our kids. Um, we've seen the board and the district ignore the wishes of parents over and over again. We've seen surveys crafted to get specific results. We've seen pronouncements about following the science and data abandoned when the district and board doesn't like what the science and data show. And now we've seen a recent New York Times article that even the dreaded Delta variant danger is infinitesimal for kids. They use a term I thought was kind of funny. They call it scariance. Certainly case rates are rising. Delta appears to be driving some of that. Fortunately, case rates are following the same pattern we've seen before. A serious control if you're an old guy over 60 like me and at risk. Not so serious if you're under 60 and vanishingly small if you're a child. Of course, adults who are concerned can simply get vaccinated and eliminate the risk. The risk of hospitalization from COVID for kids is at least 10 times lower than common things they do every day. As the time says, the biggest risk to your child's health today is certainly not COVID. It's more likely to be an activity you've long decided is acceptable, like swimming, riding a bike, or traveling in a car. Our district and our board damaged our kids' education and mental health last year by ignoring data that showed school was a safer place for kids than out in the community. Actual experience in districts like Del Mar and Cajon Valley was ignored, as was documented wishes of majority of parents. 
because the board needed to cater to the entrance of the district, not our kids. Are we now going to see that again with mask wearing? Are we going to ignore the science and data that shows there's no need for a mask on kids, as well as the science and data showing potentially harm of doing it? Are we going to ignore the impact masks have on the ability of small kids to learn or kids learning foreign languages? Are we going to, or are we going to join Alpine District in standing up and supporting our kids? The Parent Association feels the first job of our district and our board needs to be to listen to parent voices and do what they want to do for our kids. As a director of that group, I applaud all parents who have turned out to make themselves heard. We urge parents to join the Parent Association at parentassociation.org, as well as organizations like Let Them Breathe at letthembreathe.net <laughs> to bring strength in numbers and support the Let Them Breathe legal effort for this as well. One thing we can also see from this, the benefits that would come if we had true school choice in our state. If parents could simply choose schools that offered options that suit them and their kids better, we wouldn't be having this meeting. The only kids going to school here would be kids whose parents agreed with OUSD's philosophy. I assume the board doesn't agree with that parents have a choice. The board feels parents should be forced to accept their mandates whether they like it or not. Parents who want to join in that real solution here are urged to sign up to support at californiaschoolchoice.org or by texting the word school choice, all one word, to 66866. That's school choice 66866. Let's get our kids back in school the right way so they can start learning again. Thanks. Next speaker, Heather Johnson. Thank you, board members, for having a meeting so early. Thank you, School of Choice. Thank you, Let Them Breathe. Um, we are here to demand you do your jobs and protect our children's right of choice. Children are not at risk of dying from COVID. Children are not super spreaders. The CO2 levels from 15 minutes of wearing a mask on any job site would have it closed down and sued. The pathogens, bacteria, and fungi found in masks from children's masks that were sent to a private lab is repugnant. Any box of paper masks you purchase gives the warning that this will not protect against a virus, including COVID. From third grade science class, my son knows masks are not used in hospital settings to protect from a virus, but from bacteria, as the pores of masks are way too large to stop a virus. <clears throat> All we're asking for is the choice. You have the power to stand up and not punish, isolate, or bully our children into wearing masks that they don't want to. Alpine School Board chose to let the children and their parents have a choice. Thank you. Next speaker, Desiree Famia. Hello. Um, Good evening, Dr. Vitali and distinguished board members. My name is Desiree and my nine-year-old daughter attends North Terrace. I'm here to discuss the mask mandate for elementary students in our district, which I oppose. First, I do not align with any political party, nor do I judge anyone's personal opinion on what is best for them and their children. As of today, 335 children have died from COVID. Sad, but not enough to warrant a mask mandate for all students in our district. Um, most of them had an underlying condition. Most children with COVID have mild uh, symptoms or are asymptomatic. What's even more concerning is that 78% of people hospitalized or died were obese. The CDC shows the rate of obesity in children is startling and increasing at an alarming rate. It is well known that obesity levels decrease with education. It's mind boggling that we are concerned about so many COVID-19 prevention measures and turn a blind eye to the fact that obesity is the main reason COVID has hospitalized and killed our fellow Americans. The state of California has now said all children will be receiving free lunch. I applaud the state and I know that many children will now not go hungry. Uh, one only needs to know how unhealthy the food that our schools serve our children is. I hope that we all can logically understand that 
I'm sure she knows, um, that COVID is never going away. Why not look at a major contributing factor that we all can agree on and that outcome having a positive ripple effect on the community as a whole? My main concern here is the mental, physical, and spiritual well-being being of our elementary children being jeopardized, be it wearing masks during school hours and maintaining distance from one another like you guys are not. Um, okay. Um, my daughter has subcutaneous lesions and has a headache the majority of days and not, and watching her spirit diminish has been very, very difficult. Reduced social contact and schooling has taken its toll on all our children. Most masks are not hygienic in regards to children not wearing them properly, not getting a clean mask every day, etc. And then to impose this, knowing the harm we are doing with such minimal risk without a mask, is asinine. Um, additionally, we are a beautiful coastal city, and the masks that are littered on our beach to every parking lot I see is just another negative to this mandate among a million others. Teachers and staff are adults and should be able to abide by the CD guidelines if they wish to do so. School, 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 uh, school sites have the personal, should have the personal choice to adjust their guidelines on masks and see fit that each individual has the opportunity to make their own choice. Why not let individuals choose? I am immunocompromised, and I do take extra precautions to protect myself and my family. This should be a choice, not a mandate. A smile can literally change a person's day. With so much loss for our children, I beg of you to let parents decide what is best for their child. We are one of only nine states with a school mandate, mask mandate. Our school district has not done the best managing our horrible state leadership that has flip-flopped on COVID guidance, and I understand you guys have had to go with the punches, but really have not done a great job. Um, this is an you. opportunity to do the right thing. Your time is up. And thank you for listening, I appreciate it. Thank you. Next speaker, Jamie Ballard. Hello. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board. It's nice to actually be here in person. That was a really great presentation on the um, plans for COVID coming up in this school year, but one very important thing was missing and it was glaring. There was no data. There was a lot of words of how you were going to do testing and all this quarantining and I didn't see any data to support it. But I can't blame you because in our local and state governments, we don't need data anymore. Throw it out the window. Science left this conversation months ago. I've been a scientist for 20 years working in infectious disease. I have done tens of thousands of RT-PCR reactions, and I could give you a lecture on what a crock it is to use those for a diagnostic test for COVID. I also understand that you folks, you have to follow regulations. I hate it, and I'm sure there's some of you that hate it too. So I understand that aspect, that in a way your hands are tied. So right now, as we represent thousands of parents, we're trying to take the fight to where we can make a difference by getting rid of this horrific governor and taking a lawsuit to the state of California. But there is gonna be a time where we bring this fight back to this door and we are going to remember the stance that you took. Did you choose rules and BS regulations that don't have a whole lot of data to support them, or did you side with parents who some of you elected you to this board, and did you side with children and their mental health and their happiness and their smiles? We will remember we will remember because we have to look at our kids' face every day with the masks and these quarantines and testing. I'll be danged if you're gonna stick a Q-tip up my kid's nose for an asymptomatic test. I'm angry and I wanna take it out on someone and I apologize that I'm taking it out on sometimes people that can't make a difference whether they want to or not but unfortunately, this is my outlet. So I am reminding you again, do what's right. Please, every time that you have the opportunity to choose children's smiles over masks, choose smiles. We will remember. Thank you.
Next speaker, Jennifer Levitin. Oh. All right, we are still on public comment. Are you ready? All right, this is my first time, so, <laughs> but I'm proud to be here and I'm proud to speak um, what we need to speak more about to you guys and us as parents need to fight for. So, okay, here we go. As you know, the CDPH has announced they are leaving the enforcement of the mass mandate up to each district. I am here today urging you, our district, that you adopt a policy which truly removes the stigma of mask by not punishing students, my child, our children, and for non-compliance and allowing them to choose to wear one or not. I am asking you today to allow students to choose to breathe clean air and not their own. Let them breathe. By hiding teachers and students' lips and muffling their speech, mask wearing makes it harder for young children to develop linguistic skills and prevents children with hearing impairments by lip reading. By not allowing them to read facial cues, teachers and students of all ages are more likely to be misconstrued and another severe problem for children with autism. I am asking you today, how are children supposed to develop social skills when they can't even see one another's faces? They can't sit together. They can't play together in a normal school environment. After everything our children have suffered, my child, our children have suffered this year and last year, they deserve a school year free from unscientific and punitive restrictions. You, as our educational leaders in our community, it is your duty to provide this to them. Let them breathe. Thank you. Susan Custer. Good evening. I would just like to ask, mention one thing that was left out of the presentation. Will the parents have to give authorization before their children are vaccinated? It would be absolutely horrible to not get the parents' permission first. Um, well, you don't know the child's history. You don't know the family life. There's a lot of unknowns that you will not know. So it would be wonderful, I think, if you told the parents how you stand on that matter. Thank you. I just want to clarify that we would be providing locations for vaccinations. We wouldn't be vaccinating students without parent permission. We're simply providing the locations and the opportunity for people to do so. I, I think we're done with public comments. And so I'm going to turn to the board. And it's our time for board discussion. <laughs> so, so I just want to clarify, there, there is no vote on this item tonight. Um, this is a presentation of information. And uh, I want to clarify for the community that I, I know that people believe that um, boards have individual ability to make decisions about this information. Uh, we do not. We take the director from the county health department and uh, from Dr. Wilma Wooten. Um, the, the statement on this is that the guidance is clear. Everyone in the K-12 setting is expected to wear masks indoors regardless of vaccination and enforcing the mandate is not optional. All right. We are moving on to the next item. I'm looking at my fellow board trustees. Do you have any other? Do we have another public comment, Anne, for this item? We're double checking, so patience. No, we have a process for that. You fill out a board agenda, your, a public comment card.
Presentations are provided by district staff. And some items, so we have a couple of minutes. Some items are information only items and some are items that we actually vote on. And so if you have a board agenda, which are posted um, the Friday before our board meetings on Tuesday, it'll say on each item, whether it's a presentation, whether it's information only, or whether it's an item we vote on. So all of this is public and that we, for transparency purposes. So we have to follow a procedure because it's on our agenda because How that's do we the Brown Act. That agenda? Yeah. How do we change because, um, um, public comment. Okay, well, we can, I will entertain your questions after the board meeting is over. And I'm happy to educate you on how a board meeting runs. I remember being a parent and showing up to a board meeting for the first time to figure it out. All right, moving on to item six. Do we have another public comment or not? So I called all of those that indicated they wanted to speak on item 6A. The rest of the comments are for public comment, which is at the end of the agenda. All right, we'll let you speak. And we... The one thing I would like to ask, I want to hear the speakers. I really want to hear what you say, especially if they take the time and energy to come up and speak. Sometimes when you guys are cheering them on, and I appreciate your passion, we all do, I want to be able to hear what they're saying, and sometimes it, I can't hear them when you're doing that. So I would ask you to refrain from cheering until they're finished, if that's what you would like to do. Thank you, first of all, for letting me speak. I really appreciate it. I'm Sharon McKeeman. I've been a part of the Oceanside community for over a decade. My kids are not currently in Oceanside schools, but I'm here to let you know, as a previous speaker did, that we understand that you're under a state mandate right now. We understand you're all in a difficult position, and that's why we are advocating to the state. We are taking action to hopefully get rid of that state mandate. However, you have a responsibility in the meantime these are our children, and you have a responsibility. There are other school districts that are standing up. These parents are begging you to do what is right for our children because we know that if we don't free their smiles, if we don't allow them to have their faces uncovered, there may not be smiles left. We're seeing the damage done to our children. And these beautiful kids are here with us today. How do you feel, guys, about the mass? How do you feel when your faces are covered? Who wants to tell me? Yeah. Tell, tell, tell them how you feel. Yeah. Well, well, I don't really like it because it sucks, and also, <laughs> it's hard to breathe. There you yeah. go. You just say it really loud. Tell them how you feel, guys. Tell them how you feel. Or up on your tiptoes. You can bend that microphone down. Can we bring it down? There we go. There we go. I don't like masks because they, they give me headaches, and they aren't doing any good. They really aren't doing any good. The, the holes in cotton masks are 100 times bigger than COVID particles. Thank you for listening to them, guys. I know it's hard. There's a lot of science and a lot of data out here, but this is who matters. How do you feel about masks? We can't breathe, and it feels worse. Oh. Thanks for sharing. Come, come tell them how you feel. Oh, we got, we got to pick you up so they can see your smiling face. What do you, how do you feel about masks? <laughs> well, I can't really breathe in it. Yeah. And they call it a smoke location. So. Communication. Communication? <laughs> so, can't really breathe. Can't really breathe. Yeah. I don't like masks because I can't breathe and they also give me a headache. Yeah. How do you guys feel? Tell me how some of you feel when you see smiles. How does it make you feel? Happy. Happy? Happy. Yes. Come, come share it. Come share your uh, your beautiful smiles, girls. What, what do you, how do you feel about masks? How do you feel? I don't like them. Yeah, you don't like them. What it, What would it feel like if you could go back to school and see everyone smiles? So happy and yeah. excited. Happy and excited. Mm -hmm. So you've heard it from them, guys. I know that you're in a difficult spot, but please 
take action for our kids. Speak to the state, tell the state that you need to have local control back. You need to be able to do what is best for our children. You, you. The state shouldn't be doing our job as parents or your Thank job you. as the board. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have concluded public comment for that item. Our next item, it's a presentation, information item only, item 6B. This is Proposition 8, Bond Projects Update. And I'm going to invite Penny McGrew to come up as the presenter and share information with us. Thank you. So good evening. President Begin, a superintendent, Dr. Vitale, and esteemed board members. I have been working for the district for a little over three years, and I've only met with you one time in person, so I'm thrilled to be here. It's so much better to see you in person. So um, our bond program update, um, oh, I guess I'm the controller. We'll begin with talking about the remaining Prop H bond funds that we have. I'll talk to you about the Prop H timeline on the website, go over some recently completed projects, some current projects, our modernizations at San Luis Rey and Jefferson. Then we'll talk about the master plan and everything that we've been doing with that. And then we'll finally close it with Measure W. So current Prop H bond, we've currently received $180 million in series A through F. Of that, we've expended about $137.5 million. We have $2.5 million encumbered in contracts or purchase orders for a balance of $40 million. We still have one series, series G, that we will be selling in 2022, so next year for $15 million, which will bring the total of Prop H up to $195 million, which is the cap for Prop H. That leaves us a balance of $55 million. The majority of that has been earmarked for San Luis Rey and Jefferson modernization. Moving over to the Prop H project timeline. Uh, I shared this with you in December, but if you go to the bond construction program um, portion of the district's website, you'll see this. It actually starts with Prop G. I'm just showing with you tonight um, Prop H starting in 2008, but what I really wanted to provide to you was if you look on the 2020 tab, it now shows the little dollar sign, which is measure W and its passage. So that's super exciting. And then all of the projects that we've been working on so far in 2021. And talk about a couple of recently completed projects. Again, I, these have been mentioned, but I think they're worth mentioning again. We completed at El Camino High School a, vols, a varsity softball field over at the gym. We've done a ton of work there. We replaced the roof, HVAC units, and bleachers. We added a girls' team room. We installed two large fans in the gym. And if you've not been over there to see those, I encourage you to do that. They're giant. They remind me of helicopter blades. They're huge, but they really circulate the air well. And then we've provided new paint and flooring there. Um, at the Performing Arts Complex, we've done a theater lobby upgrade. We've refurbished the theater seating, provided new house and aisle lights, and upgraded the dressing room. And again, if you haven't been there, that theater is amazing now. It looks like a classic, classic theater. Some recently completed projects that you have not seen are the locker room improvements um, at El Camino. That included LED lights installed. It was for the existing boys and girls locker rooms and the boys team room. The newly created girls team room received some cabinets. The floors and showers were power washed and resealed and base was added. The benches were stripped and resealed. 
the HVAC grills, registers, and exhaust fans were all replaced. The pictures show the before and after of the boys' locker room, and it's, it's in a stunning transformation. Still at the gym, we did the water protection project. This was a multi-step process to the exterior of the gym. And we sandblasted all of the old paint off of the exterior. We repaired the concrete. A primer coat was applied. And then we encased the building in an elastomeric paint. Elastomeric paint is about 10 times thicker than regular paint. It's almost like a rubbery, um, paint and it secures and makes the surface watertight. The pictures you see are the sandblasted to the left are the sandblasted concrete. You can see the pock marks in it from age. The middle one is the concrete repairs, so the contractor had to go through and seal every single one of those little dents. And then the one on the right is the finished product. Moving over to the performing arts complex, we did a music building improvement. We replaced the aging roof on that building, and we upgraded the choir and band rooms. We gave them paint, carpet and base, and T-bar ceilings. We did not have to put LED lighting in there because it was replaced under Prop 39. Uh, we had savings on this project, so we were able to replace the cabinet counter and sink in each of those classrooms, and we were also able to re uh, replace a portion of the ceiling in the upstairs choir room storage area that had collapsed. The drama room upgrade and roofing was also sorry, was also completed with savings from other projects. This included aging roof. Um, on the drama room, new paint, flooring, and base, new LED lights, new doors, the stage in the classroom was sanded and resealed, and the green room also um, received a refresh of new carpet, paint, and counters. So now on to our current projects. We're going to start with El Camino. We have a locker room roof and mechanical upgrade. This is kind of the finishing touches for that gym building. We're gonna be replacing the aging tile roof over the locker rooms. We're gonna replace the mechanical control system and some HVAC units that were not previously replaced. We're currently in the pre-construction phase of this. We had our pre-construction meeting this morning with the contractor and we will start this at the beginning of August. Um, moving over to the performing arts complex, we'll also be doing the finishing touches to that complex as well. We're calling it the Truax Exterior Improvements Project. So on that complex, there are five roofs of varying heights, depending on what is being taught below. We've replaced two of those, the drama room and the music building. So in this project, we'll replace the last three, which is the lobby, the theater, and the stage. And if you see in the third picture, the stage, it's a really tall, high roof. Um, so we'll be replacing those. We'll replace five HVAC units. We'll be giving exterior paint to the entire complex. We'll be replacing the handrails out in front by the Truax lobby that have become um, a skateboarder's dream. We'll, we'll replace those with skate resistant rails. And then we're gonna refresh the landscape out in the front so it will be basically a new complex. Um, it's a two phase project. Over this summer, we'll be completing the paint, handrail, and landscape, and then next summer, we'll be completing the roof and HVAC. So we're gonna leave the Wildcats and go to the Pirates over at Oceanside. This project is really similar to what we did over at El Camino, the roof and HVAC replacement. And we'll be replacing the gym roof, the HVAC units. We'll replace the clear story windows that you can see in the third photo there. And then we're gonna apply that same water protection paint system, um, the same as we did at El Camino. We're in construction right now on this and we're anticipating completion to be in late November. We're also gonna be looking at the gym lobby that has an atrium and we'll be resealing the glass dome up there. 
Um, there is a logo, as I, I know you know, there's a big logo mural on that gym. We had to take it down in order to repaint it, so we took photos of that. We've received a mock-up from the contractor, looks identical, so we're under review in that. That will be replaced um, in like kind. So I provided you a couple of action photos here. The first photo from the left to the right is a crane um, carrying the roofing material up to the top of the roof. The second one is the contractors receiving that material. The third one um, is the contractors installing the material. And then the last photo is of the concrete repair of all of the pox, like, much like you saw at El Camino. On to Jefferson. So this was presented to you in December. Um, we had gone through the request for qualification process for civil engineering, geotechnical engineering, and hazardous assessment. Those are all now complete, and we've received those final reports. In addition, we asked for a request for proposal for our, the design services. Uh, we hired that architectural firm that was selected and we're in programming right now. We've also provided the architect with all of those preliminary reports that they'll need for the modernization. And just as a reminder, we asked the architect to reimagine the front entry to provide better traffic flow and additional parking and to have the entry come in off of Cary Road and then to modernize the site. So what you see here are the design phases. I shared this with you in December related to San Luis Rey. It's the same process for Jefferson. We're currently in programming right now. We also have a variety of committees, starting with the executive committee. Um, that involves district personnel and the principal. The planning group includes the executive committee plus um, constituents from the site, teachers, support staff, custodians, that kind of thing. And then we also have focus groups, which are what we consider subject matter experts in their um, arena of the educational program. So we've held 12 focus group meetings, and through that, they were able to identify for us their needs and their future requirements. We sent that back to the executive committee, and that's where it is right now, is a basis uh, or up for discussion as the basis of design. We really need that in order to tell the architect what it is exactly that they're designing. So what you see here is what we call a bubble diagram. It is really the result of all of those focus group meetings. It identifies the needed spaces so we review this with the executive committee and we right size the project based on this so that we, we give the architect the correct direction. Had we not gone through this process, it would be very likely that the architect would take all of the information that they gathered and design something that we couldn't afford. So this, this part of the design process is super important so that we're giving them the right direction to design. So once this is complete, we'll take it to the planning committee for their review and then we will move forward into schematic design. So over at San Luis Rey, we have a lot of stuff going on. So we are at the tail end of design development, but also concurrently working on construction documents. Um, we have a meeting tomorrow with the executive committee to finalize the design development. We'll bring that back to the um, to the planning committee so they can see what exactly they're going to get. They kind of already know. Uh, the schedule, so we anticipate about a month from now that we will ask the state architect for an appointment to submit our plans and specifications. And then hopefully a month later, we'll be able to submit those plans and, and specifications for approval. While that's going on, we're gonna continue to develop our bid packages. We're gonna do a constructability and bid uh, bidability review, which is our team really digging into those plans and specifications and making sure that there's no conflicts and that it's a good set of plans. Any changes that we have would be submitted then to DSA as an addendum. 
All this time, we're still continuing to refine the budget. We're anticipating that construction will start next April or May, but that really depends on DSA, whenever we get DSA approval. So this, I really wish I had a pointer so I could talk you through some of this, but this is our currently approved plan. And I just wanted to highlight some of the areas they're listed on the right, but there will be a new administration building at the front of the site that will allow visitors and parents to enter the building from one single point of entry and gain access rather than having someone from administration go out to the gate and let people in. It will have a principal's office, a health office, a conference room, and a data room. The stage will be an addition to the existing NPR. It has an expanded height to accommodate stairs for scholars to stand on at the front of the stage, an expanded entry and exit that is exterior that allows full use of the interior of the stage, and then it also has storage in the back of the stage area. Um, there will be 15, no, I'm sorry, 14 new modular classrooms that will be flush to grade, so no ramps. They'll have an extended 20-year roof warranty, and they'll be stuccoed to look like the rest of the campus. Uh, this includes a classroom for TK, our new TK. And there will be a new outdoor area that is an outdoor eating area, I'm sorry, that is adjacent to the NPR. So st students will be able to take their lunches and go sit outside and eat. So super exciting, and that will be shaded. There's also going to be a new outdoor gathering space um, that the site can use for outdoor assemblies or small gatherings. And this will be built on a slope near the outdoor lunch area to take advantage of the natural incline for seating. There will also be some outdoor learning areas um, by the new maker space that they're going to be receiving and also outside the library area. There will also be a new path of travel for the community to access the play fields that doesn't require a trip up a sloped area, which is where they're going right now. Finally, there will be a new traffic route that allows for an expanded drop-off and pickup area and allows for vehicles to continue out of the area once they're done with their pickup or drop off so traffic doesn't get jammed. So if, if a parent is parked like near the road entry and they get their student or they drop their student off, they can just pull out and go around instead of waiting for the whole circle to go through. And then as we're doing all of this, we're also looking at the phasing and logistics plan. We have two options under review right now, and I won't go into detail with these because we're still working them out, but really what I wanted to show is that we're trying to figure out how to be the least impactful to the site. So the questions that we ask is, what do we need to occur? When do we need it to occur? And where is it gonna occur? And I just kinda wanna give you a couple of examples of that. So. I think you're familiar with the kindergarten area. We're gonna be putting two new modulars in there. One is an additional kindergarten space because a kindergarten class is outside of that area right now. So we'll put them back into the kindergarten area and we're also gonna add that TK in there. It's in a really tricky location. So one of the things that we're looking at is how do we get those modulars in there? Are we craning from the street? Are we craning from the back of the campus? That's one of the things we're figuring out. Another thing is the new classrooms that we have in the back, um, in the back of the area need utilities, and there's no utilities there. So we have to put the infrastructure in first before we can set those. Um, there's also an electrical line that is out on the sidewalk that goes into the campus. We're gonna put that underneath. We're gonna, put, we're gonna bury that, and we're also gonna have to create an electrical yard to house that. So where does that fit into that? All of that stuff is what we're working on right now, how to actually make this work. That's the phasing. And then the logistics is, where are we asking the contractor to set up all of his stuff? How are we getting deliveries on an active site? So um, on the back side of this particular location, there is an SDG&E easement. 
So we had a meeting with sdg &E on Friday to see if they would allow us to have access to that road for our contractors to get in there, for our large deliveries to be in there, so that it would be the least impactful for the site. If it turns out that they won't allow us, then we'll go to plan B. But for now, that's kind of what we're hoping will occur. So that was it for SLR. On to the master plan. So there has been no grass growing under our feet for the master plan. We had a kickoff meeting on March 18th and we've been running ever since. And we have a core planning group that meets every other week. So over a six week period of time, we identified and met with focus groups at each site. We had a facilities assessment done at each site. We did a site walk with every principal. We had community forums that were done via Zoom virtual, first time we'd ever done that. So we had a total of 42 Zoom meetings, both in English and Spanish. Finally, we have a digital survey that is in process right now. Um, it's extended until after school starts, so those parents that are not aware of it will be able to participate in that. Um, and in our last core planning meeting, the architect said so far, the response has been outstanding. It's more than any other district that he's ever worked with, so yay for us. And then, and then I just want to give you a quick sneak, sneak peek of what the master plan is actually going to look like. It's web-based, so it will be open to everyone to see. You go to the site and you click on a little icon that is the logo for the school that you want to view. It'll take you to a table of contents. And each one of those tabs within the table of contents gives you different data. It's all data-driven. The last tab will be the master plan for that particular site that shows the architect's recommended um, revisions, modernizations, or whatever it is that they determine based on all of that other information. And then the um, little gas gauge thing over there that I put up was just to show you one of the matrix that will be in the master plan that will show how a particular site rates overall um, within the district. So each site will have its own, its own matrix. Finally, we'll get to measure W. So we haven't sold our first series yet, but we're preparing for a late summer sale, which will fall in line beautifully with the completion of the master plan. We did have our first CBOC meeting. The district's legal counsel presented the committee members with their roles and responsibilities. Um, outlined the district's roles and responsibilities, and then they were able to assign dates for their future meetings for the next year. So we're all ready to go, just waiting for the projects. In addition to that, we have done requests for qualification for our pool of professional consultants. You've approved a few of them, the architectural pool and the project inspector pool. Right now out, um, we have the material and special inspections. That's due August 3rd. After that, we're working on a draft right now for a commissioning agent. And then after that, we will go to a civil engineer, geotechnical engineer, and hazardous assessment consultants. And that is the end of my presentation. Do you have any questions? I have a couple questions. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, thank you for your presentation. And Dr. Spock, also thank you for your presentation. And to the people who voted for W, thank you for your vote. Um, I'll start with San Luis Rey. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed, hopefully, you've made modifications in light of the COVID pandemic that we're suffering and will probably continue to suffer in the um, future. You talked about outdoor learning um, as well as outdoor eating areas. Okay. My concern, having visited the school several times, um, is the fact that you mentioned community access to fields. And one of the concerns that folks who work at the school are very much concerned with the campers that mm -hmm. seem to have access and our, our school, our um, school police are 
city police seem unable to um, control? How, how has the school been designed so that faculty members don't have to worry about these campers coming in at night taking like the kindergarten, they decimated the kindergarten area. Mm -hmm. So the, well, first of all, the kindergarten area is entirely um, fenced. The, the whole school perimeter is fenced. This has been a conversation for us, um, and we've discussed it quite a bit. Right now, the district direction is that the community have access to the school after hours, and so what we've done is there is a perimeter fence, and we've we're directing them to enter in a specific area rather than just having it wide open. At, right now, there is no gate that locks the campus. We did discuss that as well. But it's a catch-22 for us, right? Because if we want the community to use the facility, there has to be able to be somewhere for them to park. Uh, Trustee Evans, I can add to that also. As we go through and we look at our Measure W projects, we're gonna be having some study sessions that are open to the public. And what we'd like to do is speak with the board about what your priorities would like to be for how we go about, for example, what you just brought up, would we want gates on the driveways? Do we not want gates on the driveways? And really putting in, for example, how we do ed specs for classrooms, ed specs for facilities. Do we want to, um, where do we want fences? Where don't we want fences? So that we're consistent throughout the district. So that's something that we're gonna be speaking to you about in the study sessions that you'll have input on. Thank you. So as, as part of that, once, we, once you have that discussion and the direction is different, it won't be too late to, to make adjustments to that, to either of our projects that are currently being designed right now. Well, with the kindergarten area, with the fencing, mm -hmm. uh, at this time, do we know how high the fence is gonna be? How, I'm sorry? How high, how We're how not tall? in that level of detail yet, but it's whatever the state requires. Okay, because currently it's a, what, four feet, five feet fence that anyone can jump over. Yeah, keep in mind that that um, site has not been modernized ever. I think it was built in 1962, and it's never been modernized. So whatever the current code is, is what we will be doing. I can tell you that not only will we be replacing the fence in the perimeter, but we'll also be putting some kind of covering on it, whether that is soft softscape that um, provides you know, some type of soft barrier so that it's not just an open fence. And Trustee Evans, also we would want to be discussing if we want to fence our buildings from our playgrounds mm -hmm. or how we do want to um, put in perimeters within the school. So all of that will be things that we discuss in our study sessions with you. I need to, I need to attend the study sessions. My, my next part is El Camino. You know, um, Education is low-hanging fruit, mm -hmm. and you know it's a $55 billion a year low-hanging fruit entity, and I say that over and over and over again. My concern is, like El Camino, we built El Camino, now we seem to be rebuilding El Camino. When we make contracts with these um, architects, contractors, construction folks, is there, how long is the warranty for their, for their work? So seemingly like El Camino's had so much repair work done beyond just the normal wear and tear. Mm -hmm. It's like we were ripped off, you know. It's 50 years. <laughs> well, the work that we're doing right now has not been done. So it, yeah, I that think that great. both the gym, the gym I know was last touched I think in the 70s. But to answer your question specifically, it really depends on the scope of work. So like the HVAC units I think have like a 15 year warranty. The actual contractor is on the hook for two years. So it just depends on the scope of the work. Madam President, I'm finished. Does anybody else have any questions for Penny? I actually do, I have a couple. Oh, oh. Go ahead, Eric. Eric does. Hi, Eric. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just wanna thank you, Penny, and I, I just wanna say, uh, following your comments, again, it's really important for any 
families that didn't weigh in on the master plan to do so. I'm also really excited about the website and how open and communicative it is about our intentions with our site plan and making sure that all students have that environment that is conducive to them learning uh, to their best potential. Thanks again, Penny. Thank you. Do you want to say anything, Raquel? Yeah. Um, actually, I want to thank Penny for and the team because we've gone through a lot of of work in the process of San Luis Rey. I know specifically, I've been on that committee and. Um, in regards to San Luis Rey, you know how I feel about San Luis Rey and, and the remod for that school. I think everybody knows. Um, and I still have concerns, like even though we, we're looking at it and we're finalizing everything and we're doing everything, and I love the outdoor part of the, the being able to sit outside and do everything like that that we want to be able to do. But going back to what Ms. Evans said of we're we're looking at if if we have another thing of where we're at we're at right now what we happen to have to have students outside if a teacher decides to put their class outside are we going to be able to have that space for them to be able to do that and it's and it'll work so that we'll be able to not only have their computers work outside have everything work outside are we in the process of making sure that all that happens so that we're not again going back and trying to fund something and approving something later on because we didn't do it when we should have done it, which is right now. Mm -hmm. So I just want to be future forward, future learning so that we know that we have everything that we need right now while we're doing the build right now because I don't want the lipstick. <laughs> I had to say it. Um, we, I, I want to make sure that we're doing everything that we possibly can to make this campus beautiful and amazing because it's where we're at right now. We have the ability to do it. We've worked hard as a group to be able to do this. As a board, we'd be able, we've worked hard to be able to get the monies to be able to do this. So wanting to make sure that we do everything that we possibly can to make this campus now that one campus that we start with, that moving forward from every campus here forward, mm -hmm. that we're doing everything that we can to make them what they need to be for our students in the future, not just now, but in the future. So are we actually, I want to make sure that we're doing that. And if we're not, what do we need to do to be able to do that? Thank you. So right now we have currently three outdoor learning spaces uh, planned for San Luis Rey. One is by the library, one is by the maker space area, and then one is by the outdoor eating area. And those were placed strategically in those areas so that they're not conflicting with one particular classroom. So if a fourth grade classroom wants to go out and that outdoor space is by a fifth grade classroom, then they're gonna get the noise from that. So they were strategically um, placed there to allow for outdoor learning to occur, but also to minimize the impact to other classes around there. And then this doesn't really pertain to San Luis Rey per se, although we are planning it, but as part of our master plan, we're looking at what the future really looks like for education, and that's going into the consideration for all of the sites. And even though we are in the design for both San Luis Rey and Jefferson, those were not excluded from the master plan. They'll still be in there, and you'll still be able to see the information from there and what we've done so far on, those bo on both of those sites. Thank you. All right, if there's no more questions. Hold on, we don't take public comments, just randomly. So if you'd like to talk to Penny later, you can do that. All right, moving on, our next. Thank you. Thank you, Penny, for the presentation. Moving on to our next item, nine student services. 9A is the approval of agreement for school-based counseling services with Wellness Together Incorporated. Good evening, board. Uh, this is for an approval for increased mental health supports at our two high schools. Wellness Together is a company that we have worked with, a provider of mental health uh, services. For two years, they provide excellent service to our students um, with the permission of their parents and caregivers and provide students with opportunities to be more mentally healthy. Um, so this is an expansion of that based on our needs coming out of COVID. 
Do we have any questions for staff? I do. I actually do. Um, in regards to, I don't remember seeing any data on the actual amount of students or anything like that that we actually helped and what was the turnaround on the help that we got to the students? We can provide that to you in the Friday letter. We actually have quite robust um, um, data. They've done some really good job of telling us how many services, the amount of time that it takes for a student to receive services, and I believe they're serving around 200 and 250 students per year, but we'll have to check on that. Is that correct, Dr. Sparks? Right, so this will expand that to about 500 students um, per year. Is that total between the schools? Yes, between both uh, comprehensive high schools. I thank you. All right, any more questions? No, I'll move approval. All right, I got a first. A second. A second. All right, no more board discussion. I'll call for the vote. All in favor of approving item 9A? Aye. 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 Sorry, aye. All right, motion carries 5-0. Our next item, 9B, ratification of agreement with the San Diego County Superintendent of Schools for Restorative Practices Program. Yes, good evening, board. This is a contract for us to provide professional learning for our teachers that will help our students learn uh, positive uh, ways to build relationships, self-control, and help them to learn ways to make amends when they've had uh, wrongdoing and build skills in forgiveness. Um, approving this will allow us to have an opportunity for more professional learning for students, I mean for teachers to assist students. Any questions for staff? None. On this one. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. First and a second. Any more discussion? All right, I'll call for the vote. All in favor of approving item 9B? Say aye. 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 All right, motion carries 5-0. Next item on the agenda is item 10, special education. Item 10A is approval of expenditures by the Special Education Department for non-public school contracts, non-public agency contracts, memorandum of understanding, and independent contractor agreements for the 2021-2022 fiscal year. Yes, good evening. Our school district is um, in charge of providing education to all students, at a free and appropriate public education. And at times, um, some of the needs of our students cannot be met by our core staff. Perhaps we would have a student maybe who needs to learn Braille, or a student who needs uh, more support. So we have a series of contracts that we enter into with private agencies who have specialized services. And this item um, is a projection on the amount of money that we would spend on specialized services for our students with special needs, so that they can have a free and appropriate public education. Um, and this uh, aligns with our work as we move forward to provide that to all of our students. So your approval on this will allow us to provide that to the students. Any questions for staff? I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. First and a second, any more discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor of approving item 10A? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Moving on to item 11, which is business. Item 11A is logo redesign Oceanside Unified School District. Yes, presenting this item will be our new director of communications, Donald Benz. Donald, welcome. Good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to be here at my first board meeting, uh, members of the board, thank you. I look forward to working with you. And I'm here to talk about the logo redesign for the district. You know, we want a public facing logo that matches the heart of Oceanside Unified, which of course, those are the students. And they're innovative, diverse, and they're technologically savvy. We recently launched a new website, which I hope all of you had a chance to look at and it reflects a lot of those strengths. So we really think that it's time to redesign a logo that sends that same message. The objective is simple. We're going to develop a new logo that's representative of the district by working with a local design firm and a diverse committee of Oceanside community members who will provide oversight and recommendations. 
Now this is gonna happen over several phases. The first phase will be to select a design firm. The communications office will search for and develop a contract with the design firm who will do the following. They'll work within a timeline. They'll facilitate community meetings. They will develop logo options for board approval. And then they will also provide a branding kit and logo guidelines for approval of the new logo. Phase two is an exciting part of this project. It's the Citizen Advisory Committee. This is where we will be uh, having a group of citizens to provide their input. They're gonna be part of discovery meetings with the design firm and provide feedback on the logo design, the options, and select the logo recommendations for you, the board. Now the implementation will happen in three phases. Phase three will be the logo options presented to the Board of Education. The committee will present the logo design recommendations for board consideration and approval. Phase four will be the rollout of this new logo. The communications office will gather a branding kit and a logo guidelines for the design firm and announce a new logo to staff and to the community. And then finally, the final phase will be ongoing. It's what we're calling the implementation of this new logo. We will replace the logo across all websites, letterhead, and other materials that we have immediately or until supplies are exhausted with no additional cost. Uh, over time, we will refresh branding on signage, fleet vehicles, and other places where that logo appears. The staff recommendation, it is, that, it is our recommendation that the Board of Education approve the official process to redesign the Oceanside Unified District logo. And we'll take questions. Any questions? I have, a, I have a question about your phase three, four, and five. What is the estimated time frame for those? And I realize it's estimated. We'll have to work, once we select a design firm, we'll have to work with them on an estimated timeline. You know, we want to make sure that we follow the proper procedures and get the proper input and, and not rush anything. But um, we are still working on some of those details and that'll determine, that will be determined on who we choose as this firm. I have a comment. All right. <laughs> This is a, this is, we're in the process of that. So anyways, um, I have a question about not only the time frame, which you didn't really answer, but um, I, I'm really, I'm excited to see if we have a citizen advisory committee going through this because then it's not just picked by us, it's by a group of people. Very similar to how we did the name change for San Luis Rey. So um, I'm excited about that. Any board colleagues? Go ahead. We, I know as school begins, we're, we're not returning to normal, and we're not doing a new normal. We're really on the threshold of change. And I would hope, with, in, in, I would hope that we really do have a logo that represents the core values of Oceanside. Now, this is the only school district, I would say in the county, that includes our big brother down south, that um, in which all students feel that this is a safe harbor for them to learn. Okay. As I, I'm right. going to continue I have, speaking. I'm going to stop for a second. I appreciate your passion 100%. Uh, you know what? I, but I do have a problem when we're trying to get through this and have a board discussion. It's not that we don't want to hear you. But this is not the forum for you to shout out, out of order. This is out of order. So Excuse we me, need to conduct our business meeting. I appreciate your comments, but this is not the time to have them. We do have public comment at the end of the meeting. I'm gonna go ahead, and turn it over to Eleanor. Do you have a question? I was gonna make a comment, but um, if I'm gonna be allowed to speak, I'll make the comment. If not, I can um, stifle it right here, okay? But my concern is that um, with the, as we move towards a difference, change, whatever, with the logo, that um, we still retain the idea of our students moving forward, that our students 
having a bright future. And I'll s stop there. Um, I've got a question for staff. Um, is the, what's the projected budget cost for the uh, consultant that you would intend to retain? And you'd have to either bring that back to us for approval or? No, we don't need approval? to bring it back for approval. We're requesting the item not to exceed $10,000. Okay. That's reasonable. Um, and that's just the, that's for the design consultant to help come up with alternative designs to then ultimately bring us a choice to change or not to change. That's anyway. exactly right. And okay. we'll take those kinds of uh, comments, Eleanor, about the idea, what we want this logo to be representative of, and your idea about it being a safe harbor, whether that's represented in an updated lighthouse or some other image. Those are the kinds of things that we'll engage in with the community process because those are the kinds of things we want to hear. So we appreciate that kind of uh, input and we'll work to design a logo that is representative of what people believe. And accepting the part of the committee though, are we looking to again, are we picking and choosing? Are we gonna like do the picking and, and pick the proper people that are gonna agree with everything that we want them to say? Or are we gonna actually let the community come in and speak and do what they need to do as part of the committee? so that we're able to make those decisions, whether it be to do it or to not do it. Because my concern is that we're gonna spend $10,000 minimum or maximum on just the logo part of it. And then whatever then it, on top of that, it's gonna to cost to then change everything else on the trucks, on whatever else that we need to change it on. Then we look at all those costs on top of that. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at already our budget that we have currently, I'm looking at the figures of what that's gonna be. So $10,000 is, is it doesn't seem a whole, like it's a whole lot of money. I'm still looking at the end of everything on our vehicles, everything that has to be done, then there's a cost to all of that. So what kind of cost are we looking at that part once we figure out a logo, once something else is done, what's the cost then going to be at that point? So let me speak to a couple of those pieces. Um, one of the challenges that we have is we have multiple logos out there. So if you look, you brought up our fleet, for example. Um, we have various logos on the um, vehicles. There's not one logo that represents the district. That's one of the rationales for wanting to move forward with something new and different to land on one, uh, not wanting to choose between the options that are out there and existing on our vehicles and on documents that we have. So um, and other things we would replace. We don't, we don't have the logo in a lot of places. One of the places is business cards. Um, so those would be uh, updated as when people run out. The fleet vehicles all need better representation on the vehicles and, and one common logo. Um, so that would be the way we would phase in those costs. And as far as the committee, we had a, um, for the renaming committee for San Luis Rey, we had an application process and we had a, what we called a, uh, a blind selection process. So the people that selected the people that were on the committee read the reasons why people wanted to be on the committee without names attached or any descriptors and selected the people that were on that committee. So we would use the same kind of process. I hope there are a lot of people who wanna be on this committee and I hope we have to select and narrow down. If there aren't, then we would allow the people, you know, we're probably looking around 10, 12, but we'll also have a public input process so that anyone, regardless of whether you want to serve on the committee or not, can provide input on that. I, I just want to add, <clears throat> this is a perfect time to bring it up. We have so much, uh, so many different ways that community members can let their voice be heard throughout our district, whether it be giving input on uh, the building that we have coming up or names or uh, LCAP or our DPAC or all the different ways that, that we can involve each other and, and work together to build the future of this district in the way that it needs to be. So I just encourage everyone that is in the room tonight to to join those committees to apply and put your name in and, and, sh and come and show up and be there every month so that we can, we can build our future together. So I'm excited to move forward with this item. I think it's um, it, it seems like kind of a small thing to have a logo that we move forward together on, but it, it feels big too when we know so many big things are happening for our students. So I'm excited and I support this. I'll make a motion to approve the official process to redesign the Oceanside Unified District logo. I'll second that motion. Any more board discussion? 
All right, I'll call for the vote. All in favor of approving the logo redesign, say aye. 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 No. And we have opposed? Opposed. All right, we have four in favor. Motion carries, one opposed. Moving forward to item 11B. Approve the time frame for the official name change from San Luis Rey Elementary to Pablo Talk Elementary. Yes, the Board of Education, uh, we officially renamed the uh, San Luis Rey Elementary School to Pablo Talk Elementary School, I believe at the last meeting in June, and the board asked us to bring back a time frame about when that could be done. And I've talked with uh, the principal, Dr. Carla Aranda, and we talked through uh, what we think, what she thinks would be helpful for the staff. Um, and that's the recommendation that I'm going to make, is to give the staff an opportunity to learn a little bit more about Pablo Talk over the next year. Uh, there is a book written about him where there's information, and she's read the book, um, that she wants to provide to her staff. Um, so in that time, they can learn about Pablo Talk, also develop a uh, mascot to go along with uh, the new elementary school. So what we're recommending is giving the staff a year to do that, and when we actually break ground, which as we learned in our Prop H discussion would be somewhere around April, May, June, uh, when we literally put the shovels in the ground, right, Penny, um, that we do the official renaming and we honor the work uh, of the committee and we honor the work of um, Pablo Talk and the community he represents. Yes. Um, because there, the not reason off the top why I'm of my asking head. is that there's several books, and on Wikipedia, if it's a book, I will get you the name of the book, uh, Miss Evans. Okay. Well, I would encourage everyone to um, do Wiki Wikipedia, as well as um, the Indigenous Scholar. Okay. I would hope that we re have a book that's indicative of. Um, his academic achievements and emphasis on that and in his, um, or reading his own biography that he wrote, which is even more phenomenal. Thank you. Trustee Joyce, do you have a question? I was just gonna say the name of the book is Pablo Talk, Indigenous Scholar. I just said that. Thanks, Eric. It's hard for me to hear, I apologize. All right, we have one public comment on this item. Victoria Mariani. Hi. On the official name change of San Luis Rey, I respectfully but emphatically disagree with Dr. Vitale's recommendation to the board to change the name of SLR to Pablo Talk at the initial groundbreaking stage of the project in 2022. This remodel will take several years to complete, and while the school is in transition, it would be more authentic and appropriate for school staff to focus on researching, studying, and building relationships with the Luceno people and nurturing our visual and performing arts program in preparation for the name change and improved updated facilities. Secondly, the project will be done in stages, and some part of the school will literally be under construction during this time period. So it would seem premature to rename an institution that is in the process of such physical changes. A more appropriate time frame for our SLR and garrison communities to step up to the monumental task of inaugurating a school that lives up to the gravity of honoring Pablo Talk would be at the ribbon cutting ceremony for the finished remodel project at the San Luis Rey site. I foresee that enduring the remodel itself will be challenging enough for our students, staff, and families. Adding the pressure of assuming a new name and identity before the entire scope of work is finished is asking too much. And it is counterintuitive to providing an atmosphere that will foster the growth, positivity, and collaboration needed to make this school a success. At the very least, I implore the board to please seek the input of all the stakeholders before making a final decision on this really important matter. The stakeholders, the people most directly affected by this project are the students, staff, and families at the school. Please allow us the opportunity to have a voice in your consideration of the date of the name change. Thank you. Any? I, I respectfully disagree with that approach. I think um, we, we made the motion last meeting to name it Pablo Talk, and I'm ready to have it. Uh, I think the appropriate time is when we break ground on the major remodel. 
we've got to start calling it and honoring it Pablo Talk based on our our uh, decision to rename the school that, and we need to move forward with that. So I make a motion to go with the superintendent's recommendation and uh, at the groundbreaking ceremony for the remodeling work that the Pablo Talk uh, name officially transitions to that. I'll second that motion. All right, we have a first and a second. I, I just wanted to add, I know that committee, I didn't sound, sit on that committee, but we had fellow board members that did, and it was a very long process to come up with that name with all the suggestions that were made, and I really want to honor that committee and the work that they did. Um, nothing moves quickly when we're looking at remodeling and refurbishing a school. It's going to be two to three years out before that remodel is completely done, and I really don't want to lose the momentum we have around pop of talk. So that's just my comments on it. Appreciate that. Raquel. Well, I, again, I would encourage the faculty to read his autobiography. There are several books about him, but I think when you hear the authentic voice of the author and what he went through and his perspective, it's extremely powerful. Thank you. All right. I'm going to, if we're done with board discussion, I'm going to, um, we have a first and a second, so I'm going to call for the vote. All in favor of approving the time frame for the official name change? Say aye. 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 All opposed? Any abstentions? Did you say aye? Okay, so we have motion carries 5 0. I didn't hear you, Rebecca. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Very quiet today. All right. Next item on our agenda item 11C. Consideration of real property offers and authorizing a negotiation of a letter of intent and purchase and sale agreement. Thank you, President Begin. For more than two years, the Oceanside Unified School District has pursued the required process for sale of the former Pacifica Elementary School property. Pacifica was reviewed by the District's Facility Advisory, or 711 Committee, on May 13, 2019, and then again on June 18th, August 14th, and September 18th of 2019, and it was declared surplus property on October 16th of 2019. The district, has, the district has received two renewed offers on the Pacifica property. The two top offers are, were collected and analyzed by the district staff, legal counsel, and broker. These offers have been identified as the offers that are most advantageous to the district. The two top offers received are as follows. We have Warmington, they have offered 15800000 as well as Meritage, which is also 15800000 Based on feedback from district legal counsel and the district's broker, district staff is recommending the board accept the offer from Meritage for $15,800,000 and request that the board authorize staff to negotiate a letter of intent with Meritage in order to solidify the terms of sale. District staff also requests authorization to negotiate a purchase and sale agreement with Meritage, which will be brought back for final board approval at a subsequent meeting. Do we have any questions? I don't. We discussed this in the closed session pretty thoroughly as we're allowed to because it's a property sale. And um, I believe that uh, the recommendation that staff's making with uh, Meritage uh, is the best path at this point in time for the 15.8 million to see if they can get approvals from the city for a quality residential project there. So I'll move approval of the letter of intent and purchase and sales agreement with uh, Meritage. I'll second that. Any more board discussion? Eric? Yeah, I would just um, mention that we did uh, discuss how important it is to make sure that that land and whatever open space is built remains part of that community and the community continues to have access to it. So we have, uh, we have agreed on that as a board to include that in any agreement that goes forward. Um, so I just wanted to note that for the public and I, I'm, I'm proud of this and I'm I'm glad that we can put this property to good use. Thank you. All right, I'll call for the vote. All in favor of approving? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Moving on to item 11. D, approval to proceed with construction of new buildings to house all district office departments and functions. Thank you, President Begin. 
In March of 2018, Eric Hall and Associates conducted an asset management study, which included a study of the district office buildings located on both the northern and southern side of Mission Avenue. The study was presented to the board on October 30th of 2018, and again on February 6th of 2019. The facilities on both north and south were built in 1972. The northern facility is on about eight acres of land and is 71,669 square feet. The facility on the southern side was also built in 1962 and is on about 3.14 acres. Both buildings have been modified over the years to accommodate staffing changes, but each site still houses a number of aging facilities and neither building has been properly modernized or refurbished since initial construction. District staff has conducted a number of inquiries into potential options for refurbishment of the existing sites, lease or purchase of a new site for new construction and other potential solutions. Staff ultimately identified demolition of the current buildings and construction of new facilities is in the best interest of the district from a financial perspective. Staff is requesting board's approval to pursue construction of new district office facilities. Upon approval, staff will conduct a request for proposal or an RFP to select a project management company to oversee the process for constructing the new buildings. All departments will have the opportunity to provide input regarding the departmental needs for the individual and shared office spaces, meeting spaces, and related specs. The priority will be to consolidate all district functions from what we have are currently nine separate spaces into two. A new building on the northern side of Mission Avenue will be constructed to provide transportation facilities, maintenance and operations, and nutrition services with appropriate loading bays, refrigeration, warehouse storage offices, and modern day efficiencies. The south side building will house all other district office functions, including the boardroom, meeting spaces, and offices. District staff has identified funding from recent property sales and developer fee proceeds and the addition of additional assets for use in the construction of the new facilities, and is excited about the potential to create an innovative and collaborative space that will both improve school district functions and also enhance the surrounding community within the city of Oceanside. It is recommended that the Board of Education approve the construction of new buildings to house the district office departments and functions. Any speakers? Any speakers in? All right. We don't have any public comment on this item. All right, nope. do we have any questions for staff? No questions. Um, again, we've discussed this amongst ourselves as a property issue. I, I, it's vitally important. I've been arguing for 10 years since I've been on the board that both staffs on uh, North and South of Mission needed to be together in the same place to best serve the public and our students. And um, similar to what City Hall did in the mid 80s for, for the new City Hall that had offices all over the city scattered, the same efficiencies uh, will, be, will be seen by the by a combination of, on one site for the for the staff. So I fully support this effort and we'll move approval. I'll second. All right, we have a first and a second. Any more comments? I actually do have a comment. Sure. And here's the reason, the biggest reason for me is communication. We have, we lose so much communication um, within our, our, our offices. So we have ESS on one side and we have the, the other part of the district on the other side of the street. And so much is lost, it, it's so hard for our families to go in into this building, into this space, and then not know who they need to talk to. And so we've come up with the mentality now that there is no wrong door. So when you come into a, an office within our school district <clears throat> or a building, then you will be helped and serviced from the beginning to the end by the person that initially you talk to. When we're at two different locations, it becomes difficult because then this person doesn't talk to this person, which is what we have constantly. And as a parent within the school district, I've dealt with that. I am not happy about it. It annoys me. It drives me bananas. So having everybody now again in one location will service our families in a, in a way that have ne they've never been serviced, obviously, because it hasn't been that way. So we need to, so for me to want to move this, and, and initially it wasn't a big thing, and then the more I, I struggled with it with the fact that I was the parent that went into one office, didn't get the help that I needed, went to another office, got one person telling me to go back over there and go back over there, it, and then things never happened, which is why I'm here now on the school board. So um, so with all that said, this is, this is really what needs to happen. It, it's taken way too long, and 
in the end, the only people that it's going to really help is our families, our students more than anything, because we need to be there and make our students a priority over everything and anything that we do within the school district. And we haven't always done that, and we need to continue and grow forward with that mentality. And the only way that we can do that is to bring everybody together so that this person can talk to that person the right way that they need to, so that they don't get mixed up of, well, he said, she said, and well, I thought they took care of it. Well, and then nobody took care of it. So we're here, and I'm, I am, uh, I'm excited. I am really excited to move forward with this and to just make this happen sooner than later if we possibly can. So. All right, we have a first and a second. With no further discussion, I'll call for the vote. All in favor of approving item 11D, say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Moving on to item 12, policy development. 12A, approval of replacement of board policy 3550, food service, child nutrition program. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Began. The district regularly monitors board policy updates from the California School Board Association, also known as CSBA. OUSD has a need to update board policy 3550, Food Service Child Nutrition Program. The board policy was last updated May 11th of 2010. The new policy is being updated to reflect the current state administrative review monitoring process for food service programs and to reflect current district practices. Changes include increased student access to healthy unprocessed meals, maximizing student participation, and added provision regarding students who meet federal eligibility criteria at no cost or reduced prices. Thank you for the description. Do we have any questions for staff? Move approval. I'll second. All right. I'll call for the vote. All in favor of approving item 12A? Aye. Say aye. 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 All right. Motion carries 5-0. Moving on to the next item, 12B, approval of replacement of board policy 3551, food service operations and cafeteria fund. Thank you. This policy was last updated on May 11, 2011. This policy is being updated to reflect the new law, SB 265, which provides that students with unpaid meal fees must not be denied a reimbursable meal of their choice, eliminating the possibility of any student being required to receive an alternate meal popularly known as the cheese sandwich when I was a principal. This update also reflects a waiver granted by the U.S. Department of Agriculture extending the three-year administrative review cycle to a five-year cycle for the 2017, 2018 through 2021 through 22 school years. Thank you for the description. Do we have any questions? All right, I'll make a motion to approve. Second. We have a first and a second. No further discussion. I'll call for the vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Moving on to item 12C, revision to board policy 5141.52, suicide prevention. Good evening, board. This policy is an update to the policy that was last updated in 2010, and it includes staff development and uh, outreach to students to prevent suicide um, and to address those students who may be experiencing suicidal thoughts. This will have an opportunity to provide students with suicide hotline information and quick interventions. Any questions? I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. First and a second. Seeing no discussion, I'll call for the vote. All in favor of approving item 12C, say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Next item, 12D, approval of replacement of board policy 4113 assignment. Similarly, this is the update for a CSBA language. Uh, it eliminates old, outdated language, such as NCA. BL, which uh, was a federal program which no longer applies, and gives new ed code language to teacher assignments based on their credential and subject matter, as well as the process for vacancies and missed assignments. Thanks for the explanation. Any questions? Nope. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. First and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor of approving item 11D, say aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. All right, last item on policy development. 
Item 12E, approval of replacement of board policies, 4119.11, 4219.11, 4319.11, 4320.11, 4321.11, 4322.11, 4323.11, 4324.11, 4325.11, 4326.11, 4327.11, 4328.11, 4329.11, 4330.11, 4331.11, 4332.11, 4333.11, 4334.11, 4335.11, 4336.11, 4337.11, 4338.11, 4339.11, 4340.11, 4341.11, 4342.11, 4343.11, 4344.11, 4345.11, 4346.11, 4347.11, 4348.11, 4349.11, 4350.11, 4351.11, 4352.11, 4353.11, 4354.11, 4355.11, 4356.11, 4357.11, 4358.11, 4359.11, 4360.11, 4370.11, 4371.11, 4372.11, 4373.11, 4374.11, 4375.11, 4376.11, 4377.11, 4378.11, 4379.11, 4380.11, 4381.11, 4382.11, 4383.11, 4384.11, 4385.11, 4396.11, 4397.11, 4398.11, 4399.11, 4400.11, 4401.11, 4402.11, 4403.11, 4404.11, 4405.11, 4406.11, 4407.11, 4408.11, 4409.11, 4410.11, 4411.11, 4412.11, 4413.11, 4414.11, 4415.11, 4416.11, 4417.11, 4418.11, 4419.11, 4420.11, 4421.11, 4422.11, 4423.11, 4424.11, 4425.11, 4426.11, 4427.11, 4428.11, 4429.11, 4430.11, 4431.11, 4432.11, 4433.11, 4434.11, 4435.11, 4436.11, 4437.11, 4438.11, 4439.11, 4440.11, 4441.11, 4442.11, 4443.11, 4444.11, 4445.11, 4446.11, 4447.11, 4448.11, 4449.11, 4450.11, 4451.11, 4452.11, 4453.11, 4454.11, 4455.11, 4456.11, 4457.11, 4458.11, 4459.11, 4460.11, 4470.11, 4471.11, 4472.11, 4473.11, 4474.11, 4475.11, 4476.11, 4477.11, 4478.11, 4479.11, 4480.11, 4481.11, 4482.11, 4483.11, 4484.11, 4485.11, 4486.11, 4487.11, 4488.11, 4489.11, 4490.11, 4491.11, 4492.11, 4493.11, 4494.11, 4505.11, 4506.11, 4507.11, 4508.11, 4509.11, 4510.11, 4511.11, 4512.11, 4513.11, 4514.11, 4515.11, 4516.11, 4517.11, 4518.11, 4519.11, 4520.11, 4521.11, 4522.11, 4523.11, 4524.11, 4525.11, 4526.11, 4527.11, 4528.11, 4529.11, 4530.11, 4531.11, 4532.11, 4533.11, 4534.11, 4535.11, 4536.11, 4537.11, 4538.11, 4539.11, 4540.11, 4541.11, 4542.11, 4543.11, 4544.11, 4545.11, 4546.11, 4547.11, 4548.11, 4549.11, 4550.11, 4551.11, 4552.11, 4553.11, 4554.11, 4555.11, 4566.11, 4577.11, 4578.11, 4579.11, 4580.11, 4581.11, 4582.11, 4583.11, 4584.11, 4585.11, 4586.11, 4587.11, 4588.11, 4589.11, 4590.11, 4591.11, 4592.11, 4593.11, 4594.11, 4505.11, 4506.11, 4507.11, 4508.11, 4509.11, 4510.11, 4511.11, 4512.11, 4513.11, 4514.11, 4515.11, 4516.11, 4517.11, 4518.11, 4519.11, 4520.11, 4521.11, 4522.11, 4523.11, 4524.11, 4525.11, 4526.11, 4527.11, 4528.11, 4529.11, 4530.11, 4531.11, 4532.11, 4533.11, 4534.11, 4535.11, 4536.11, 4537.11, 4538.11, 4539.11, 4540.11, 4541.11, 4542.11, 4543.11, 4544.11, 4545.11, 4546.11, 4547.11, 4548.11, 4549.11, 4550.11, 4551.11, 4552.11, 4553.11, 4554.11, 4555.11, 4566.11, 4577.11, 4578.11, 4579.11, 4580.11, 4581.11, 4582.11, 4583.11, 4584.11, 4585.11, 4596.11, 4597.11, 4508.11, 4509.11, 4510.11, 4511.11, 4512.11, 4513.11, 4514.11, 4515.11, 4516.11, 4517.11, 4518.11, 4519.11, 4520.11, 4521.11, 4522.11, 4523.11, 4524.11, 4525.11, 4526.11, 4527.11, 4528.11, 4529.11, 4530.11, 4531.11, 4532.11, 4533.11, 4534.11, 4535.11, 4536.11, 4537.11, 4538.11, 4539.11, 4540.11, 4541.11, 4542.11, 4543.11, 4544.11, 4545.11, 4546.11, 4547.11, 4548.11, 4549.11, 4550.11, 4551.11, 4552.11, 4553.11, 4554.11, 4555.11, 4566.11, 4577.11, 4578.11, 4579.11, 4580.11, 4581.11, 4582.11, 4583.11, 4584.11, 4585.11, 4596.11, 4597.11, 4508.11, 4509.11, 4510.11, 4511.11, 4512.11, 4513.11, 4514.11, 4515.11, 4516.11, 4517.11, 4518.11, 4519.11, 4520.11, 4521.11, 4522.11, 4523.11, 4524.11, 4525.11, 4526.11, 4527.11, 4528.11, 4529.11, 4530.11, 4531.11, 4532.11, 4533.11, 4534.11, 4535.11, 4536.11, 4537.11, 4538.11, 4539.11, 4540.11, 4541.11, 4542.11, 4543.11, 4544.11, 4545.11, 4546.11, 4547.11, 4548.11, 4549.11, 4550.11, 4551.11, 4552.11, 4553.11, 4554.11, 4555.11, 4566.11, 4577.11, 4578.11, 4579.11, 4580.11, 4581.11, 4582.11, 4583.11, 4584.11, 4585.11, 4596.11, 4597.11, 4508.11, 4509.11, 4510.11, 4511.11, 4512.11, 4513.11, 4514.11, 4515.11, 4516.11, 4517.11, 4518.11, 4519.11, 4520.11, 4521.11, 4522.11, 4523.11, 4524.11, 4525.11, 4526.11, 4527.11, 4528.11, 4529.11, 4530.11, 4531.11, 4532.11, 4533.11, 4534.11, 4535.11, 4536.11, 4537.11, 4538.11, 4539.11, 4540.11, 4541.11, 4542.11, 4543.11, 4544.11, 4545.11, 4546.11, 4547.11, 4548.11, 4549.11, 4550.11, 4551.11, 4552.11, 4553.11, 4554.11, 4555.11, 4566.11, 4577.11, 4578.11, 4579.11, 4580.11, 4581.11, 4582.11, 4583.11, 4584.11, 4585.11, 4596.11, 4597.11, 4508.11, 4509.11, 4510.11, 4511.11, 4512.11, 4513.11, 4514.11, 4515.11, 4516.11, 4517.11, 4518.11, 4519.11, 4520.11, 4521.11, 4522.11, 4523.11, 4524.11, 4525.11, 4526.11, 4527.11, 4528.11, 4529.11, 4530.11, 4531.11, 4532.11, 4533.11, 4534.11, 4535.11, 4536.11, 4537.11, 4538.11, 4539.11, 4540.11, 4541.11, 4542.11, 4543.11, 4544.11, 4545.11, 4546.11, 4547.11, 4548.11, 4549.11, 4550.11, 4551.11, 4552.11, 4553.11, 4554.11, 4555.11, 4566.11, 4577.11, 4578.11, 4579.11, 4580.11, 4581.11, 4582.11, 4583.11, 4584.11, 4585.11, 4596.11, 4597.11, 4508.11, 4509.11, 4510.11, 4511.11, 4512.11, 4513.11, 4514.11, 4515.11, 4516.11, 4517.11, 4518.11, 4519.11, 4520.11, 4521.11, 4522.11, 4523.11, 4524.11, 4525.11, 4526.11, 4527.11, 4528.11, 4529.11, 4530.11, 4531.11, 4532.11, 4533.11, 4534.11, 4535.11, 4536.11, 4537.11, 4538.11, 4539.11, 4540.11, 4541.11, 4542.11, 4543.11, 4544.11, 4545.11, 4546.11, 4547.11, 4548.11, 4549.11, 4550.11, 4551.11, 4552.11, 4553.11, 4554.11, 4555.11, 4566.11, 4577.11, 4578.11, 4579.11, 4580.11, 4581.11, 4582.11, 4583.11, 4584.11, 4585.11, 4596.11, 4597.11, 4508.11, 4509.11, 4510.11, 4511.11, 4512.11, 4513.11, 4514.11, 4515.11, 4516.11, 4517.11, 4518.11, 4519.11, 4520.11, 4521.11, 4522.11, 4523.11, 4524.11, 4525.11, 4526.11, 4527.11, 4528.11, 4529.11, 4530.11, 4531.11, 4532.11, 4533.11, 4534.11, 4535.11, 4536.11, 4537.11, 4538.11, 4539.11, 4540.11, 4541.11, 4542.11, 4543.11, 4544.11, 4545.11, 4546.11, 4547.11, 4548.11, 4549.11, 4550.11, 4551.11, 4552.11, 4553.11, 4554.11, 4555.11, 4566.11, 4577.11, 4578.11, 4578.11, 4579.11, 4580.11, 4581.11, 4582.11, 4583.11, 4584.11, 4585.11, 4596.11, 4597.11, 4508.11, 4509.11, 4510.11, 4511.11, 4512.11, 4513.11, 4514.11, 4515.11, 4516.11, 4517.11, 4518.11, 4519.11, 4520.11, 4521.11, 4522.11, 4523.11, 4524.11, 4525.11, 4526.11, 4527.11, 4528.11, 4529.11, 4530.11, 4531.11, 4532.11, 4533.11, 4534.11, 4535.11, 4536.11, 4537.11, 4538.11, 4539.11, 4540.11, 4541.11, 4542.11, 4543.11, 4544.11, 4545.11, 4546.11, 4547.11, 4548.11, 4549.11, 4550.11, 4551.11, 4552.11, 4553.11, 4554.11, 4555.11, 4566.11, 4577.11, 4578.11, 4579.11, 4580.11, 4581.11, 4582.11, 4583.11, 4584.11, 4585.11, 4596.11, 4597.11, 4508.11, 4509.11, 4510.11, 4511.11, 4512.11, 4513.11, 4514.11, 4515.11, 4516.11, 4517.11, 4518.11, 4519.11, 4520.11, 4521.11, 4522.11, 4523.11, 4524.11, 4525.11, 4526.11, 4527.11, 4528.11, 4529.11, 4530.11, 4531.11, 4532.11, 4533.11, 4534.11, 4535.11, 4536.11, 4537.11, 4538.11, 4539.11, 4540.11, 4541.11, 4542.11, 4543.11, 4544.11, 4545.11, 4546.11, 4547.11, 4548.11, 4549.11, 4550.11, 4551.11, 4552.11, 4553.11, 4554.11, 4555.11, 4566.11, 4577.11, 4578.11, 4579.11, 4580.11, 4581.11, 4582.11, 4583.11, 4584.11, 4585.11, 4596.11, 4597.11, 4508.11, 4509.11, 4510.11, 4511.11, 4512.11, 4513.11, 4514.11, 4515.11, 4516.11, 4517.11, 4518.11, 4519.11, 4520.11, 4521.11, 4522.11, 4523.11, 4524.11, 4525.11, 4526.11, 4527.11, 4528.11, 4529.11, 4530.11, 4531.11, 4532.11, 4533.11, 4534.11, 4535.11, 4536.11, 4537.11, 4538.11, 4539.11, 4540.11, 4541.11, 4542.11, 4543.11, 4544.11, 4545.11, 4546.11, 4547.11, 4548.11, 4549.11, 4550.11, 4551.11, 4552.11, 4553.11, 4554.11, 4555.11, 4566.11, 4577.11, 4578.11, 4579.11, 4580.11, 4581.11, 4582.11, 4583.11, 4584.11, 4585.11, 4596.11, 4597.11, 4508.11, 4509.11, 4510.11, 4511.11, 4512.11, 4513.11, 4514.11, 4515.11, 4516.11, 4517.11, 4518.11, 4519.11, 4520.11, 4521.11, 4522.11, 4523.11, 4524.11, 4525.11, 4526.11, 4527.11, 4528.11, 4529.11, 4530.11, 4531.11, 4532.11, 4533.11, 4534.11, 4535.11, 4536.11, 4537.11, 4538.11, 4539.11, 4540.11, 4541.11, 4542.11, 4543.11, 4544.11, 4545.11, 4546.11, 4547.11, 4548.11, 4549.11, 4550.11, 4551.11, 4552.11, 4553.11, 4554.11, 4555.11, 4566.11, 4577.11, 4578.11, 4579.11, 4580.11, 4581.11, 4582.11, 4583.11, 4584.11, 4585.11, 4596.11, 4597.11, 4508.11, 4509.11, 4510.11, 4511.11, 4512.11, 4513.11, 4514.11, 4515.11, 4516.11, 4517.11, 4518.11, 4519.11, 4520.11, 4521.11, 4522.11, 4523.11, 4524.11, 4525.11, 4526.11, 4527.11, 4528.11, 4529.11, 4530.11, 4531.11, 4532.11, 4533.11, 4534.11, 4535.11, 4536.11, 4537.11, 4538.11, 4539.11, 4540.11, 4541.11, 4542.11, 4543.11, 4544.11, 4545.11, 4546.11, 4547.11, 4548.11, 4549.11, 4550.11, 4551.11, 4552.11, 4553.11, 4554.11, 4555.11, 4566.11, 4577.11, 4578.11, 4579.11, 4580.11, 4581.11, 4582.11, 4583.11, 4584.11, 4585.11, 4596.11, 4597.11, 4508.11, 4509.11, 4510.11, 4511.11, 4512.11, 4513.11, 4514.11, 4515.11, 4516.11, 4517.11, 4518.11, 4519.11, 4520.11, 4521.11, 4522.11, 4523.11, 4524.11, 4525.11, 4526.11, 4527.11, 4528.11, 4529.11, 4530.11, 4531.11, 4532.11, 4533.11, 4534.11, 4535.11, 4536.11, 4537.11, 4538.11, 4539.11, 4540.11, 4541.11, 4542.11, 4543.11, 4544.11, 4545.11, 4546.11, 4547.11, 4548.11, 4549.11, 4550.11, 4551.11, 4552.11, 4553.11, 4554.11, 4555.11, 4566.11, 4577.11, 4578.11, 4579.11, 4580.11, 4581.11, 4582.11, 4583.11, 4584.11, 4585.11, 4596.11, 4597.11, 4508.11, 4509.11, 4510.11, 4511.11, 4512
I have two items of concern that I wanted to bring to the attention of the board. Number one, I wanted to point out a gaping hole in OUSD's planning for summer. Teachers were told by email that district platforms like iReady would be open and available for student use until early August, except that no one accounted for the current 2021 fifth grade students. They were made to turn in their Chromebooks at their elementary sites, but somehow there was no plan in place to direct middle schools to issue incoming sixth graders devices so that they could minimize their COVID learning gap by utilizing OUSD resources over the summer. Not only is this a totally preventable travesty, but I'm personally embarrassed as I directed students to use these programs in their report card comments. The district's unpreparedness makes me look foolish. This oversight also affected outgoing fifth graders who attended summer school. But I'm thankful to my principal, Dr. Rhonda, and our librarian, Ms. Gomez, for quickly reissuing student Chromebooks for summer school use, but I'm not sure that my colleagues at every other elementary school sites were as lucky. My purpose in informing you of this is so that it does not happen again next year, and so that outgoing elementary fifth fifth graders next year are not left in the lurch. Second, I want to state my extreme disappointment that teachers were not informed at all about the process or considerations taken by OUSD in reassigning vice principals. It seems like it was done randomly in a veiled attempt at achieving the path of least resistance, as in how do we lessen complaints on the outcome answer, make it totally random, which is ridiculous. Teachers have to differentiate daily, so why are relevant factors not considered by district higher-ups when assigning the crucial role of vice principals to school sites? SLR is in great need. Historic low test scores and high turnover of teachers and principals, oldest, most dilapidated site in the district, plus the merge, the impending remodel, the rush to rename, all this reflects why we should have been able to keep Jen Andrews as our vice principal. We have a disproportionate number of students qualifying for or in need of qualifying for extra support. We endured a year of the carousel of principals and are now thrilled to have Dr. Aranda. But Jen Andrews was a proactive dynamo who knows a significant amount of students on the radar in the queue being watched for assessment so they can be given the appropriate support to ensure academic and socio-emotional progress. OUSD should have examined each pair of schools and made conscientious, informed decisions based on individual cases. For example, since Reynolds is getting a new principal, the fabulous Liliana Gonzalez, it would make sense that a new VP be assigned there and SLR could have kept Ms. Andrews. That would make sense. But OUSD leadership didn't see it that way. They instead assigned Ms. Andrews to Fusat, which makes no sense at all and is totally random. I am saddened and disheartened by this decision and by OUSD leadership's continued unwillingness to include and inform teachers and principals in and of important decision making that directly affects them and their students. Thank you. Next speaker. Anna Ellen. Next three speakers, Graham Frazier, Joyce Kaneen, if Graham is in the room, you can come up. And then Susan Custer. Members of the board, um, Graham Fraser, 50 year resident of Oceanside, former um, district engineer for the district between 1990 and about 2000. Got involved in a lot of the school site projects, so I was quite uh, um, taken by the, by the changes and the progress made here. And congratulations on that. Um, but I was struck, this the other number of points, uh, the fact that there was no invocation tonight. There was no Pledge of Allegiance. Does that reflect the, the position of the Oceanside School District uh, Board and their, and their, and their policies? Um, so I'd like, I'd like an answer on that, please, if I could get a written answer on that one. Uh, I'm here tonight to talk about uh, critical race theory. And I want to tell you, I have read, almost read, the whole 800 pages that the Department of Education has put together for model, pro model uh, uh, curricula. And I challenge each of you to read that. I've also read in detail the 25-page curricula that's currently uh, proposed for this current school year. I believe it's the second time it's been out there. And I'm really struck by the fact that it's really, uh, I saw as a propaganda, um, document. In fact, one of the items here that really bothered me was that the, the course, reading from the uh, course outline, this course aims to provide an, answer, an emancipated education. What the hell does that mean? Yeah. That tells me that there's a, a, a going into the whole thing, it, there's a, a, um, a position that they're still in chains. To be emancipated, what are they being emancipated from? I mean, this wording is really inflammatory, really inflammatory. And I've read through the whole thing here, really. To me, this is propaganda for Black Lives Matter. 
This is propaganda. And really, you should be ashamed to actually put your stamp on this. Really, it is very demeaning to each and every person that has done that. Um, yes, it is sick. Critical race theory is ethnic studies is a Trojan horse. Inside the Trojan horse is critical race theory, which, which the principle of critical race theory is the most important thing is the color of a person's skin. That's totally opposite to what uh, Martin Luther talked about. So what's happening to this country? What's happening to you guys that you would accept this crap? Thank you. Thank you. Our, our next speaker. Good evening, president and school board members. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the, the content of their character. Wow, what powerful words. I remember them well. Dr. Martin Luther King delivered his historic I Have a Dream speech at the Lincoln Memorial on August 28, 1968. There was still segregation, and we had a long way to go. What critical race theory is doing is unexplainable to me, and it is certainly backtracking from Martin Luther King's vision. How can teachers look at white children as young as five or six in the face and explain racism to them and tell them they are racists? Oh, and tell black and brown children they are victims. That will either deflate their spirit or make them angry, and none of the above is an option. If America is as racist as teachers' unions say they are, how is it that Obama was elected twice with only a population of 12% black people in our country? Explain that to me. Tribalism is not good and neither is CRT. Thank you. And will you call up the next two speakers? Susan Custer? Yeah, okay. I thought there was something before me. Good evening. What is, what is Marxism? Simply put, Marxism is a destructive political philosophy which has been tried in other countries and has always failed. The aftermath is always a society left destroyed and starving. Critical race theory is a Marxist theory based on race. The goal of, of Marxism is to remake a free society. This is accomplished by dividing the society into, group, into groups and pitting the groups against each other, the oppressed and the oppressor. In the teachings of critical race theory, Whites are the oppressor and non-whites are the oppressed. Critical race theory states that the oppressors, white people of today, must be oppressed in order to pay for the sins of their ancestors. This is co the complete opposite of the American belief that all men are created equal. As a re result of critical race theory, or the code name, ethnic studies, White students are taught that they are bad because all white people are inherently racist. Children of color are taught that they can only achieve their goals by demeaning and destroying other groups instead of using their talent and hard work. These teachings demoralize all children. Schools should empower children to follow their dreams, work hard, and develop their natural talents. Our enemies are thrilled that we are teaching the next generation to hate each other while their children are excelling in math and science in order to replace the United States as the world leader. If this country hopes to survive as a world leader, we must focus education on the subjects that made the United States a leader in the first place, math, science, reading, and writing. We cannot change the past, but we can shape the future. We need to give our students knowledge to succeed in the competitive world of the future. 
Children are born to love everyone. They have to be taught to hate. Critical race theory is teaching hate. The United States is the, is the most multicultural and least racist society in the world. I, I know this through personal experience. To be clear, critical race theory is Marxism. Marxism tries to destroy a society in order to remake it. Stop using our children to destroy our society and stop teaching hate. Thank you. The Thank next you. Sp three speakers are Michael Richardson, Kate, Katie Taylor, and Michelle Harrington. Good evening. My name is Michael Richardson. I was born in Oceanside in 1941. I uh, grew up in South Oceanside. I was in the first class at South Oceanside Elementary School. Went there uh, for the first through the sixth grades. <coughs> Sev uh, seventh grade was at the old Horn Street Junior High School, which was torn down. So I was in the first class at uh, Jefferson Junior High School. I guess you call it middle school now, right? <laughs> uh, my class actually named the school. And one of the things uh, that you learned when you first arrived there was that you couldn't graduate until you passed a test on the Constitution. New concept, huh? This was a test that was given to at the end of the year so the, the entire year in social studies, do you still have those classes? The entire year was spent studying not just the Constitution, but you know, the history surrounding the Constitution. And, and um, so we, we had that test, and that test was important. And I understand, I've talked to people who were in the in, in the, uh, the school in the, in the uh, 1970s and 80s. I guess it was abandoned in the 90s. Can you tell me what happened? That's right, exactly. Somebody has taken our, our history and our culture and our uh, government studies out of the schools and that just doesn't make sense and replaced it with Ethnic studies and racism and and uh, all you know. I think it's pathetic, and I think it's time that you looked inside yourselves and realized that you need to put the study of our government and the study of history back in our curriculum. I think you need to stop wasting time talking about your logo and talk about your kids yeah. and the and the study and the study of our country. And their, its history and um, our and our government. I have a suggestion. Why don't you just have a contest for the logo with your art students and save a lot of money and time? Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Well, before I get started, there's something I have to do. Dr. Sparks, you're fired. What I heard tonight from you was just unbelievable. But anyway, most of you know I'm here to speak against the ethnic studies program that you have already all approved. Let me read something to everybody from this. Oh, and by the way, there may not be many of us left here tonight because we're willing to wait it out to tell you our opinion, but the people that are here, we will not give up until this garbage goes in the trash dump it belongs in. <laughs> and I just want to remind, this is straight from the guide. I've been through it. It's just garbage. It's trash. Right. Okay, this is one of the things you want to teach the kids. Students will learn about how prisons and capitalism, let me repeat that. Students will learn about how prisons and capitalism work together to put people of color in prison. Students will be introduced to prison industrial complex and understand how powerful this has become in California and America. Did you really approve that? I know. And, the, and it, you know what? It's page after page of stuff just like this. So anyway, as you're fully aware, I'm here to discuss my disgust with this document 
that you call ethnic studies. I emailed all of you, or most of you, and anybody who wants the email from me that did not receive it, I'll be happy to send it to you. All documents, lawsuits, complaints from parents all across the country, and a detailed, detailed analysis of this right here by the Californians for Equal Rights, which you should read in detail. Excuse me? Would you like to come up here and speak too? Come on. Yeah. Well, you're not stopping him. Well, you want to talk to me. He asked me up. Well, you're talking, so I can't hear myself. Yeah. All right, you guys. Excuse me. You need to address the board during public comment. I know, but All right, keep going, please. You have a minute. Okay. I'm here to tell you loud and clear, you and any teacher that agrees to instruct these materials will be responsible for creating racism, bigotry, divisiveness in the Oceanside school system. I'm here to tell you your attempt to teach our children Marxism and socialism will not proceed without a fight. As parents and teachers all across the country are filing lawsuits to stop critical race theory. And don't tell me this isn't critical race theory. Don't tell me, oh, it's ethnic studies. You know darn well that's the root of everything in this document. I'm here to tell you your blatant attempt to take control away from parents by instructing their children to believe schools and governments know what is best for them to learn about people and how we should view each other is outrageous. It's proof we need cameras in every single classroom to know what the teachers are doing. Yeah. I'm here to tell you we will not let you push your false narrative onto our children while they sit as your innocent victims right. in class. Thank you for your time. I gave you an additional 20 seconds. Thank you. Oh, you gave me an additional 20 seconds. I All right, next speaker, please. To have my voice I really don't like it when you point your finger at me. Michelle I am listening to you. Harrington. Next speaker, please. Is Michelle Harrington here? Well, I am certainly here. And you know what? I work seven days a week on my own business. I'm raised in a Marine Corps family, and I was appalled that you guys did not say the Pledge of Allegiance. One thing that you've got to remember is we are all Americans. That's why we're here. We finally woke up. It's like a badly run HOA, which I am now president of my HOA, because the first time I attended that meeting, I thought, what the hell is going on? I can still say that word. So the thing is, is I thought, at, I'm 68, that the last thing I would be would be here at a meeting monitoring you guys. Now, you're all American. I see a lot of doctors here. You work damn hard for that doctorate. So I would like you to get out of your intellectual bubble. I call this self-proclaimed intellectualism in this country, where we can't talk. And obviously, I've listened to you guys. I don't think you're reading uh, what I just heard here. I'm shocked. So I'm um, a great grandmother, and I thought I'd never be here in America talking about stuff like this. Let's get back to the bottom line. Like I said, I was raised in a Marine Corps family. I'm very proud of our nation. We are the freest country in the world. We all know it. Martin Luther King has been spoken amongst my generation. I come from the 60s, believe me, and I've never called myself a feminist. It makes me sick. That word, I've lived my life, I've done my own thing. I say what I want, I do what I want, and I'm telling you, if you guys continue to go in this way, we will be having government-run schools, not public schools. This is what our taxpayers pay for. So just give your kids and my great-granddaughter the opportunity to have a free life. Enough of this stuff going on in the schools. Now, I don't know what pressure you're under, I respect all of you. you. You've listened well, and I don't like disruptions and people cussing, and it, it's unnecessary, but we gotta use our heads. And one thing I'm not gonna lose is my freedom to speak, to assimilate, to talk whatever I want in America. You know, all of this diversity, my God, we're all Americans. I've never called anybody a name. I've, I've traveled the world with my dad. When I was 13, I was taught respect, you know, and I'm telling you, uh, the first time I thought I was in Hawaii, uh, working at my first job was a pineapple factory. And what do I have? This big Hawaiian chick, beautiful chick, telling me, uh, Howley, pick up your pineapple. She wanted to beat the crap out of me. I'm telling you, we ended up having lunch together and getting along because that is who we are. I don't hate anybody. Nobody really hates me as far as I know. So why don't we just have common sense? 
and get back to the basics. And I would suggest that any time you get these things from the state or whatever on critical race theory, this is all news to me and I'm doing my homework now. I'm back to John Dewey, who started the Dewey Decimal System because we've been screwed up since the 50s. So you all have experienced freedom. Let our children have that same freedom, okay? And I pray Thank to God you. that you vote against the mask wearing. I know you've Thank got your agenda. Thank you for your time. But enough, enough is enough, okay? And you're Thank grown you. man. Next you speakers, kids. Patty Kay, okay. Julie Sterk, and Deborah Tobias. Good evening. Competition is the engine that drives success. Whether it is in oneself to be the best person you can be, or in sports to strive for a team win. This ethnic studies, CRT curriculum, destroys this challenge. It levels everyone in the classroom by making them a victim of skin color, gender, socioeconomic status. For an example, the new proposed California math curriculum states, one, we reject ideas of natural gifts and talents. Result, they want to do away with the advanced math classes, possibly given back in the 11th or 12th grade. Example, this curriculum disagrees with finding the correct answer or showing the work. Not acceptable. I certainly want my physician, my surgeon, the engineer who builds towers and bridges to have excelled, especially in math and science. Oceanside latest school uh, scores in math show 63.77% have not met or exceeded the standard. In science, 74.12% have not met the science standard. Compared to all 50 states, California is ranked 40th in best education. Not acceptable. Okay. okay. Is CRT the code word in your last workshop that you said many times that you are not able to say anymore? Just asking. Julie, can I assume that since you were named Superintendent 2021 Equity Champion, congratulations, that you um, totally endorse Oceanside Ethnic Curriculum? I'm wondering, do you, Julie, feel any guilt earning a six-figure salary due to the color of your skin? My challenge to the board tonight, have an anonymous survey of teachers and parents on who does and does not want CRT, your ethnic studies, taught in the classroom, please. Thank you. Good evening. I attended Oceanside Unified School District's last Zoom board meeting and was shocked to find the first 45 minutes of the meeting was about children's, was not about children's education. There was no mention of basic fundamentals of reading, writing, or arithmetic. No, the board used this time to promote critical race theory. I am the biological grandmother of three little blonde-headed, fair-skinned, sweet boys. You'd never know that they were of Mexican-Asian descent by just looking at them. Critical race theory, otherwise known as ethnic studies, Assembly Bill 101 or AB 101, is anti-God, anti-American principles, and it promotes bigotry. CRT authorizes teachers to discuss gender, race, sexism to our children. In other words, teachers will be given the rights over parents' rights to teach this principle they call unity and value based on a totalitarian mindset. We have seen great strides in our time where many of our leaders are men and women of color. CRT will destroy everything they fought and bled to accomplish. Our children are losing in academics while children in China and other countries are eating, breathing, higher learning. We're wasting our children's future by focusing on feelings and racism. 
The school's job was never to teach moral values. This is a job of parents or guardians to teach right and wrong, to love your neighbor as yourself, treat others kindly, and to be respectful to all, regardless of the color of their skin, leaving teachers to teach academics. Good jobs are becoming more competitive and less as this world of technology grows. We can't afford to squander our children's future because someone in office thinks teaching racism and low expectations is more important, which proves CRT is less about education and more about indoctrination. Thank you. Uh, members of the board and families here. Um, I'm ashamed to say that this is my very first school board meeting because I had no clue that these things happened. But I'm excited to see what you guys are gonna do for us. I did just wanna say before I get into my whole spiel is I believe we all have hearts for the children. I believe you all have hearts for the children. I believe that of course our families have hearts for the children and we're not enemies here. So please consider what I have to say. It's not said out of any hate or discontent. So um, first I wanted to say thank you for allowing me to um, express my strong opposition to the ethnic studies here um, in my children's classrooms. We are a military family uh, with three kids, elementary, middle, and high school here in the Oceanside School District, and we just got here in December. It's been rough for my kids to find friends here um, but I'm so excited that they finally have found friends and their friendships are based off of how much fun they have together, how much they make each other smile, how kind they are together, not on the color of their skin. And that's something that they learned at home. Their mom taught them to love everyone. That's something that they learned at church, something that's breathed into them from the word, of the, the, word the Bible. Seeing my upcoming freshman's daughter, daughter's schedule, there was ethnic studies on there. And at first, I thought it would be a great thing until I really dove into it and figured out what it actually was. And now I can't not imagine the following situation that happened in an actual Pennsylvania school. Imagine two new friends, my daughter just making new friends, two 14-year-olds. They're at opposite ends of the classroom and one of them is considered oppressed and the other is considered not oppressed. These two girls were just having lunch together and they were laughing and joking about their dad's ridiculous dad jokes that they shared at the barbecue the night before. So they're confused as to why one is called an oppressor and one is called oppressed when they, they live side by side. I just wanted to say, um, Critical race theory is also called the ethnic studies, but let's just face what it really is. It's modern day segregation. And it's the antithesis of Dr. Martin Luther King's um, dream of being judged by the content of your character and not the color of your skin. And I hope and pray that my kids never uh, are indoctrinated with this mindset that they are villains because they are white or that their new friends are oppressed because they are black. Thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker, Pam Chambers. Superintendent, board members, good evening. I would like to discuss also tonight the Oceanside Ethnic Studies Program. California law AB 2016 states that ethnic studies should, quote, prepare students to be global citizens with appreciation for and understanding of multiple cultures and ethnicities in the United States. That is not what this program does. It's the same Marxist ideology as CRT. It's the same student outcomes, the same revisionist history, the same one-sided radical ideas, the same vocabulary, the same sources, the same authors. It's the same thing as CRT. The board passed the program May 2020, from what I understand, during COVID. Thank you. Have you considered the consequences of this, consequential, this controversial program for the students? How do you measure the success of this program? And if the results turn out to be students with hearts and minds filled with hate, 
How do you unteach it? How do you remove the poison? For parents who disagree with this program, they may remove their children from this district, which means less ADA money. For the parent who can't afford to remove their child from the school district, they must tell their child that the teacher is wrong. Don't trust the teacher and what they say. No parent wants to say that. It may pit parent against parent and reduce parent participation. For teachers who oppose this, there could be animosity stirred between the teachers due to the highly political nature of this program. Consider lawsuits against the district by individuals or groups. Another consequence of this radical indoctrination is the passage of a school choice initiative. The Oceanside Ethnic Studies program is a Marxist ideology, the same as critical race theory. I ask you to suspend this program this year, 2021. It requires much more discussion in the open and in person with community members and parents with the passage of AB 101, if it passes, it will require, require this for graduation, which makes it even more compelling that this program should be reviewed and revised. Return to AB 2016 and study cultures and ethnicities in the United States, but also promote the ideals of equality, freedom, and character. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that is our last public comment of the evening. Yes, Dr. Begin, uh, we uh, greatly apologize for not having the Pledge of Allegiance at the beginning of our meeting. Um, it was an oversight. It was something that we removed during COVID. And so we would love it to now have everyone rise uh, for, for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, let's do that. Ready, begin. All right, we have item 14. Is there anything from our board members? Any final comments? How about a policy? How about a question? For all of us who spoke. All right, um, item 15, I move to adjourn the meeting. It's adjourned at 8.43.